All right. Good evening, everyone. We'd like to go ahead and welcome you to the Fruit of City Council meeting. Uh, the time is now 7.02 p.m. and we're going to go ahead and call our meeting to order. Deb, would you please call roll? Mm -hmm. Councillor Bremen? Here. Councillor Purser? Here. Councillor Williams? Here. Councillor Cries, excused, absent. Councillor Miller? Present. Councillor Hansi? Here. All right. We're going to move into our moment of silence and pledge of allegiance. Could you all stand with us? We'd uh, like to take the opportunity to allow a moment of silence for all faiths and beliefs, the opportunity for a silent prayer. Thank you. If you'd please join me in the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible with liberty and justice for all. All right, we got an agenda before us. Are there any changes to that agenda? No changes to the agenda, Mr. Mayor. All right, do we have a motion to approve the agenda? I move to approve the agenda. Second. All right, we've got a first and a second. Any other questions or comments on that? All right, hearing none, would you please poll council? Councilor Bremen? Yes. Councilor Purser? Yes. Councilor Williams? Yes. Councilor Miller? Yes. Councilor Hansi? Yes. Motion passes 5 0. All right. Uh, we've got uh, one proclamation and one uh, presentation tonight. And so our first one's a proclamation. Uh, uh, and I'm asked Amy to read that, but it's for National Long-Term Care uh, Residents' Rights Month. And uh, we've got Jesse Bond here that can talk. Once we read the proclamation, we'll ask you to come up and you could say a few words. So go ahead, Amy. Whereas there are 1.3 million individuals living in 15,600 nursing homes and over 800,000 individuals living in 28,900 assisted living or residential care facilities in the United States, and whereas the Federal Nursing Home Reform Act of 1987 guarantees residents their individual rights in order to promote and maintain their dignity and autonomy, and whereas all residents should be aware of their rights so they may be empowered to live with dignity and self-determination. And whereas we wish to honor and celebrate these citizens to recognize their rich individual individuality and to reaffirm their right to vote and participate politically, including the right to have a say in their care. And whereas individuals and groups across the country will be celebrating Residents' Rights Month with the theme, Amplify Our Voices, emphasizing a community of long-term care residents coming together to make their voices heard. Now, therefore, we, the Fruta City Council, on behalf of Mayor Joel Kincaid of the City of Fruta, do hereby proclaim October 2023 as National Long-Term Care Residents' Rights Month in the City of Fruta, and encourage all citizens to join us in these important observances. All right, if you'd like to come up and say a few words. Keep this short and sweet. I just want to thank the council for taking a moment to keep our residents in long-term care visible in our community. And I just ask that you also keep them visible in your thoughts. And as we do our planning, just remember them. There's a lot of people out there that treat them as invisible. I just ask, don't let that be any single one of us. Thanks. All right, well, come on up. We've got a proclamation for you. I thank you so much for what you do, yeah. All right, we're going to move into our, well, it's our Tabor Review Committee uh, report. And so we're going to have a presentation from the uh, Tabor Committee that we set up. So who's in charge of that one? Margaret's going to do that. <laughs> <laughs> we have uh, three members of the committee, Robin, uh, Melissa, and Heather here. And I think Melissa's going to do a presentation for you. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks for having us here tonight and thanks for giving us this opportunity um, to be on the committee and review things. Um, there were five of us. Um, what was nice about this committee that I felt 
I was somebody new. I'd never been on a committee. I'm just starting to get involved in our city and things that go on. So it was nice to hear from those that have been involved for quite some time and those that have not. We had great opinions from all over the spectrum. Um, so it was it was really good conversation. So Robin wants to talk tonight just a bit about her feelings <laughs> of the committee and then we'll get into what our job was and what our recommendations were. Hi, my name's Robin Digg and I say ditto to everything that she just said. I was had the pleasure of getting to know some very nice, well-informed people on this committee. Uh, and they took it very seriously. I just have a little blurb I'd like to read, if I may. I joined this committee very skeptical that the potential removal of the Tabor tax refund that has been approved by Colorado citizens was being removed. I wanted to be a citizen voice and an ear as to what this committee was all about. In being asked to join this committee, I learned the true purpose of this committee, which is to be held accountable to the citizens of Fruta as to the funds and spending of such funds on the improvements made to our community. I found this committee dedicated to funding accuracy and keeping its citizens duly informed that what they have been entrusted to by Fruta citizens to do, they did. I learned so very much from the other members of this committee. Though it was discussed at our meetings to have these funds remain in perpetuity, it was decided that a six year review of how these funds were allocated would remain intact, thereby continuing the accountability to the citizens on the usage of these Tabor dollars. I agree with the rest of the committee that this initiative should be placed on the upcoming April 2024 ballot. I believe the citizens of Fruta have been provided with what the Tabor expenditures promised. Thanks. Well, good job, Robin. She pretty much um, just said our whole presentation <laughs> in her thing. So, um, Yes, we, we've been pleased um, reviewing the history of Fruta and Tabor um, that the city has done, what they said that they would do with the funds, what their plans are to do with the funds in the future. So really, our recommendation is to um, continue going to the people, going to the voters, putting it on the ballot again in April 2024, and asking the citizens to vote that the city gets to keep um, the retention revenue. I just think one of the significant pieces that you're talking about talking in the microphone. One of the significant <laughs> significant conversation pieces for us. I mean, there was Karen, myself, and Lori on there who who knew quite a bit, and um, Robin and Melissa were new to it all. And they had great questions, and and then Margaret was there, obviously, with all of the stats and data that we needed. Um, a couple of significant pieces were, I don't remember the exact dollar amount, it was like $9.8 million in capital projects that we were able to accomplish. And six of it was from the excess revenues. And so then the rest were the matching grants. There were so many grants that we were able to apply for because we had the revenues in our account that then we were able to get the grant money and do even more because we we kept the um, we kept the revenues. And I think that was significant. Seems like there was there were lots of significant moments. Actually, we we had a riotous good time. <laughs> um, yeah, and and they had really good questions. And I think the committee itself is like the best of democracy. You you had people from left, right, and in the middle, and everywhere in between. Everyone was bringing forth their own questions and and having really great civil discourse. And then we all came to pretty much the same conclusion that if, as long as accountability is built in and we know where the money's going to then it, it makes sense to be able to do these huge projects for our city that we couldn't otherwise do. So yeah, it was a great process. All right, does it, I just wanna say thank you guys for serving on that committee. It's always yes. good to yes. have a diverse committee that's willing to talk and give us insight. So I don't know what else, if anybody else has any questions or comments for. My only comment is thank you for the effort and the seriousness and all the effort uh, and everything you put into it. So thank you very, very much. 
Yes, thank you all. Thank you, thank you so much. Don't go away yet because we got to make sure we approve the recommendation. So do we, <laughs> if, if there's a, no other discussion, do we have a motion to accept this? I will gladly move to accept the Tabor Citizen Review Committee 2023 final report and proceed with the introduction of an ordinance to implement mm -hmm. the recommendation of the committee and place a question on the ballot for the April 2nd, 2024 regular municipal election for voter consideration. I'll second. All right, we've got a first and a second. Is there any other questions or comments related to this? All right, hearing none, would you please poll council? Councilor Purser? Yes. Councilor Williams? Yes. Councilor Miller? Affirmative. Councilor Hansey? Yes. Councilor Bremen? Oh, yeah. Motion passes 5-0. <laughs> All right, well, thanks again. Thanks, for guys. Your time. <laughs> You're welcome to sit through the next three hours if you want. <laughs> Come on, Heather. All right, with that, we're going to move into our public participation. Uh, so this section is set aside for the city council to listen to comments from the public regarding items that do not appear on the agenda. Generally, the city council will not take any action on these items. So if there's anybody in the audience that would like to speak on something that's not on the agenda, now is your opportunity. All right, I'm hearing none. Um, we're gonna go ahead and close public uh, participation and move into our consent agenda. So these are items where all conditions or requirements have been agreed to or met prior to the time they come before council for final action. They'll all be voted on with one uh, vote. Uh, so with that, we're gonna open up the consent agenda. So if anybody in the audience would like to speak on any item on the consent agenda, now would be your opportunity. All right, I'm seeing none. So I'm gonna close public participation and consent agenda and bring it back to council. Does anybody have any questions or comments on consent? Hearing none, do we have a motion? I move to approve the consent agenda as it appears before us. Second. All right, we've got a first and a second. Any other questions or comments? All right, hearing none, Deb, would you please full council? Councilor Williams? Yes. Councilor Miller? Yes. Councilor Hansey? Yes. Councilor Bremen? Yes. Councilor Purser? Yes. Motion passes 5-0. All right. With that, we're going to move into our public hearings. Uh, we've got uh, three public hearings tonight. The first two are quasi-judicial hearings. Uh, both of them are liquor permit applications, and we've got our Deputy City Clerk, Deb Woods, here to present. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Good evening, City Council. Uh, Deb Woods, Deputy City Clerk. And I'm presenting the Greater Grand Junction Sports Commission's application for a special event liquor permit. The event is the Rimrock Marathon, which will be held this year on Sunday, November 5th from 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. at the Fruita Community Center. The Greater Grand Junction Sports Commission has requested to provide beer at this year's Rimrock Marathon, which starts at various locations on the Colorado National Monument and finishes at the enclosed backyard of the Fruita Community Center. Participants will receive one free beer ticket as part of their entry and additional beer will be available for sale by the Greater Grand Junction Sports Commission. The diagram, <clears throat> excuse me, of the proposed license premises included in your council packet illustrates the area at the, at the community center that will be enclosed with fencing and it has one exit and entrance. IDs will be checked and wristbands will be issued to those who are 21 or over at the one entrance slash exit into the licensed premises. Fruita Chief of Police Dave Krause reviewed the application and provided his statement that there was nothing that would prohibit the issuance of the license being requested. Therefore, it is staff's recommendation to the City Council that the application for the special event liquor permit be approved subject to the following conditions. One applicant will discontinue serving alcohol at 5.30 p.m. to allow patrons 30 minutes, 30 minutes to finish their beverages and leave the area. Two, all alcohol will be secured and removed by 6 p.m. And three, the licensee needs to be aware that they're solely responsible for control of the licensed premises in regard to alcohol possession, consumption, and adherence to state and municipal laws. And that concludes my presentation and Ben Snyder with the Greater Grand Junction Sports Commission is present this evening. There he is as the applicant's represent, representative. So I'll turn it over to Ben for any additional comments he will have. Thank you, Deb. Thank you, Council, for allowing this to be reviewed. Um, Deb said exactly how it's gonna work. 
uh, runners were finished across the finish line right in front of on um, the east uh, west side of the Fruta Community Center, go right into the backyard where uh, beverage food will be provided to them. Any questions from the council? All right, we're going to open up public comment, and then if anybody has questions, sure. we'll come back to you. All right, with that, we're going to open this up to public comment. If there's anybody in the audience that'd like to speak on this item, now's your opportunity. All right, hearing none, we're going to close public uh, comment and bring it back to council. Does anybody have any questions? I know it said 6 p.m. I know your flyer says event over at 5 p.m. So is we anticipate being out of there, honestly, by 4.30 at the latest, but there's always the opportunity for some stragglers that may turn into walkers by the end of the race. <laughs> we'll, give them, we'll give them the time up to 6 p.m., but you never know. So, Okay. I move to approve the application for a special events permit for the Greater Grand Junction Sports Commission to sell beer from or for the Rimrock Marathon at the Fruity Community Center subject to the conditions stated by staff. Second. All right, we've got a first and a second. Any other questions or comments? All right, hearing none, Deb, would you please poll council? Councilor Miller? Yes. Councilor Hansi? Yes. Councilor Bremen? Yes. Councilor Purser? Yes. Councilor Williams? Yes. Motion passes 5 0. Thank you, Ben. Thank you very much. All right, and then we're on to our, our next uh, special event liquor permit application. We have Deputy City Clerk Deb Woods here to present. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, the second special event liquor permit application was submitted by the Fruta Area Chamber of Commerce. Uh, the name of the event is Cups for a Cure, which is a fundraiser to help bring awareness to breast cancer. Uh, the Fruta Area Chamber of Commerce has requested to sell and serve beer and wine at Cups for a Cure. And the diagram of the licensed premises included in your council packet illustrates the area at Civic Center Memorial Park that will be enclosed with the fe with fencing. Signage will be placed throughout the licensed area stating that no alcohol is permitted outside the fenced area. Chamber staff and volunteers will be monitoring the licensed area and the consumption of alcohol to ensure that no alcohol enters or leaves the area. Through the Chief of Police, Dave Krause, reviewed the Chamber's application and issued his statement that there was nothing that would prohibit the issuance of the license being requested. And one thing I forgot to mention was the, uh, the date and time of the event, which will be Saturday, September 28th from 1 to 4 p.m. here at Civic Center Memorial Park. It is staff's recommendation that the City Council approve this application for the special event liquor permit subject to the following conditions. Applicant will discontinue serving alcohol at 3.30 p.m. to allow patrons 30 minutes to finish their beverages and leave the area. All alcohol will be secured and removed by 4 p.m. And the licensee needs to be aware that they are solely responsible for control of the licensed premises in regard to alcohol possession, consumption, and adherence to state and municipal laws. And that concludes my presentation. We've got Kayla Stack with the Fruta Chamber uh, with us virtually tonight. And I will ask her to introduce herself and she can provide any uh, further information that uh, you guys may have. Thank you. Yeah. October 20th. Oh, yeah, sorry about that, October. <laughs> Thank you. Hi, can you hear me? Yep. Yes. Kayla. <laughs> Hi, my name is Kayla Stock. I'm the program and event coordinator for the Fruit Chamber. <clears throat> um, we're asking for a liquor license for our Cups for a Cure event, which is, as Deb said, um, at Civic Center Park, October 28th, 1 to 4. And this is just to raise, aware raise awareness for breast cancer and proceeds from this event will be donated to Family Health West and Community Hospitals um, Foundation. All right. Um, with that, then we're going to open it up to public comment. So if there's anybody in the audience that'd like to speak on this item, now's your opportunity. All right. Hearing none, we're going to close public comment and bring it back to council. Does anybody have any questions related to this? None. All right. Then do we have a motion? Mayor, I move to approve the application for a special events liquor permit for the Fruit Area Chamber of Commerce to sell and serve beer and wine at the Cups for the Cure event to be held on Saturday, October 28th, 2023, from 1 to 4 p.m. at the Civic Center Memorial Park, subject to the conditions stated by staff. Second. 
All right, we've got a first and a second. Any other questions or comments? All right, hearing none, Deb, would you please poll council? Councillor Hansi? Yes. Councillor Bremen? Yes. Councillor Purser? Councillor Williams? Yes. Councillor Miller? Yes. Motion passes 5 0. Thanks for being here, Kayla. Thank you guys so much. I appreciate it. All right. With that, we're going to move into, uh, we've got a legislative hearing. It's ordinance 2023-12. It's a second reading amending the chapter 2.39 of the Fruta Municipal Code concerning membership of the Fruta Planning Commission. we got our finance director, our city clerk, Margaret Sell, here to present. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, what you have before you is an ordinance that removes the requirement that a city council member or the mayor serve as a member of the Fruta Planning Commission. Um, a fairly simple ordinance adjustment. Um, and you know, position then could be appointed by a citizen, to a citizen of the, the city. All right. With that, we're going to open up to public comment. So if there's anybody in the audience that'd like to speak on this item, now's your opportunity. All right. Hearing none, we're going to close public comment and bring it back to council. Does anybody have any questions on this item or comments? Amy, no. I'm just wondering when the final, <laughs> when am I supposed to stop going to meetings? <laughs> 30 days after the ordinance is adopted. Is that correct? That's Yes. Okay. So I'm planning on the next one, right? Yeah. So okay. November will, sure. <laughs> and November will be the joint, uh, oh, that right, night yes. will be the joint uh, planning commission council meeting anyway. And then I, I then it should be a, effective. I would yes by, okay. by the December meeting. So, so you, so you've attended the big last one at the last. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that was a good way to go out. <laughs> Lots of participation. All right. You have enough quorum. Yeah. Yeah, we got a full. That'll be got... the only empty seat. So right. That'll be that'll be nice. Awesome. So after this, then our next step would be to advertise it again, correct? Because it's not advertised currently. Correct. <clears throat> All right. Any other questions or comments on this one? No. Do we have a motion? Sure. I move to adopt ordinance 2023-12, amending chapter 2.39 of the Fruta Municipal Code and removing the requirement that the mayor or a council member serve as a member of the Planning Commission. All right. We've got a first and a second. Any other questions or comments? All right. Hearing none, Deb, would you please poll council? Councilor Bremen? Yes. Councilor Purser? Yes. Councilor Williams? Yes. Councilor Miller? Yes. Councilor Hansi? Yes. Motion passes 5 0. All right. With that, we're going to move into our administrative agenda. So, our first item is 2024 budget presentations on infrastructure and core services. And we've got Shannon Vassen, our assistant city manager here. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, members of the city council, for the opportunity to present this presentation to you tonight. Of course, Heather always talked about this mic and now it's starting to fall down <laughs> as soon as she leaves. Who is in charge uh, no. of those? <laughs> I know, ironically, it's just a screw that we need to tighten. Uh, I, <laughs> we'll, we'll work with it. Uh, yeah, this is the second of uh, five presentations, formal presentations regarding the 2024 budget. As our charter requires, you did have a the draft budget presented to you at the September workshop by the city manager. Tonight, we'll be covering capital projects, core services, and our enterprise funds. And then November 7th, uh, two weeks from tonight, three weeks from tonight, I forgot we have the fifth Tuesday, we'll cover quality of place and personnel, then dive into economic health and development and a budget overview for November 21st, and the budget will be adopted in early December. Um, so as part of this presentation, again, we'll just cover our 2024 capital projects and also any projects that have been reappropriated or will be reappropriated to next year. We'll briefly touch upon core services and kind of trends we're seeing across all funds, and we'll touch upon our enterprise funds as well. Um, so before I get into the capital projects, I just want to give you a general overview of the proposed 2024 budget. Um, as a whole, we have 33.7, about $34 million in expenses. Um, if you were to look at the all fund summary, that number is about 42 million. But for our purposes, we exclude transfers from one fund to another, because that's kind of like counting the expenses twice. Like, for example, the general fund, we have 
$6.3 million. We transferred to the capital projects fund for a specific capital projects. But then that's an actual expense for the project in the capital projects fund. So $33.7 million in expenses. Um, this is an increase of 14% compared to the prior year budget. And this is mostly due to two projects um, next year, 19 Road and also the South Mesa Street that we'll be carrying forward. Uh, revenues, we are estimating about $27.3 million overall. This is a decrease of less than 1% from the 2023 budget. Um, and that's mostly just because we're wrapping up a number of capital projects this year, especially out at the wastewater reclamation facility that we got grant funding for. Um, I think between the aeration project and the H2S project, we received about $1.6, $1.7 million. So that's kind of where you see the decrease uh, from this year's budget, just due to wrapping those projects up. And we're certainly happy to have those uh, hopefully be completed soon um, and by the end of the year. And then as our Tabor question allows, as you heard from the committee tonight, we're using about $6.4 million in fund balance to pay um, for some of these capital projects. That is the deficit that you see in front of you. And all that money is being spent on either capital projects or equipment as well. There's a few of the smaller funds, like the irrigation fund. We have, I want to say, 4000 being used for equipment just to help uh, with some replacements that we have. Um, so this is your 2024 expenses overall, excluding transfers. Um, for operations, we have $18.3 million. That's things like personnel, salaries, benefits, purchase professional services like your engineering, your attorney, um, professional development. We have purchased property services, um, kind of everything uh, minus capital and a few other things like debt for operations. Capital is by far your biggest expense for next year at $13.3 million, roughly 40% of the overall budget. And we do have a little over $2 million in debt for the Fruita Community Center and also the wastewater reclamation facility. So dive right into our capital projects for 2024. Um, these projects were recommended to you by a team of uh, uh, members on our leadership team. It include myself, our public works director, parks and recreation director, um, our, and our city engineer. Uh, we looked at prior year budgets and we looked at some of our projects that we've been working on. And we noticed that, you know, due to the pandemic, due to supply chain issues, we're carrying forward a number of projects, which has been kind of frustrating for us overall. So our theme, once you take out the 2024 strategic plan projects, uh, was we want to get things uh, done next year that are achievable, have been communicated by the community, and things that um, we can get some of these dollars spent down on. So a lot of the projects you see in the 2024 budget are projects we anticipate getting done next year, and hopefully we'll be able to uh, use some of those reserves on projects that will benefit the community. As always, our biggest capital expenses are are spent on um, streets and traffic congestion. Uh, back to the 2021 community survey, this is always the top two priorities of the community. The third one was to improve city communications, and I think we've done that very well since then. But again, maintaining the quality of city streets, limiting traffic congestion are the two top goals of the community. So you'll see the bulk of our money for capital being spent on that. So diving right in, our biggest project next year is to make improvements to 19 Road. Uh, we have $6 million uh, in the budget for this project uh, next year, and that is excluding the $400,000 in right-of-way acquisition that we have uh, budgeted for this year. So by the time this project gets done, we'll anticipate maybe $6.4, $6.5 million, depending upon where it comes in. Um, the picture you see here, this is straight from Google Maps. This is the current condition of 19 Road. As development has occurred and will continue to occur, Along 19 Road, we need to uh, make some changes for safety reasons, but also CDOT has requested that we make a number of changes to 19 Road as well. So the new 19 Road will include and through intersection turn lane, pedestrian path, they'll widen the road as well, and then we have several drainage improvements uh, to complete as these subdivisions come in. Um, after right away, we anticipate that construction will begin in the fall and will um, uh, merge over into 2025. And of course, with any project of this size, $6 million, over $6 million, we will continue to pursue grant funding, um, but we haven't found any specific opportunities that are a good fit for this project yet. But as the federal um, grant programs continue to be rolled out, we will always look for um, grants to offset the cost to the uh, Fruita residents. Um, we have been very successful in grants. I think tonight we have probably 
between South Mesa Street, uh, Maple Street Bridge, and then all of our sewer projects, we've probably four to five million dollars just in grants that we've received in the past three to four years. So we always try to leverage those dollars as best as we can uh, to cut down the expense on our residents. If I if I could just add in that uh, I know at the workshop there was a question of how far on 19 Road, and I I wanted to clarify because I think I might have said it wrong. It was just north, uh, so it'll be just north of J.2 and all the way down to 6 and 50. So I think I said point six, and <laughs> that's been ringing in my head ever since. So I just wanted to clarify it is it is just north of J.2 and then to 6 and 50. Thank you, Mike. Uh, up next for capital projects, we do have $225,000 to update the um, design of the Maple Street Bridge replacement. Um, again, this year, I believe we have around $100,000 budgeted just for right-of-way acquisition. Um, we do anticipate receiving federal funds to fund um, the total amount of this project when it does come due for replacement. So we do have to update the design to make sure it's in compliance with CDOT standards, but also that we're going to be in compliance with all the federal standards as well, um, such as uh, wage requirements, Davis-Bacon wage requirements, but also um, by in American uh, parts and materials, uh, stuff like that. So 225,000 just for design and we anticipate construction will begin in 2025. This project has been recommended by both Senator Hickenlooper and Senator Bennett to receive congressional directed spending in the amount of $1.75 million. And we will receive $750,000 from Mesa County for this project. So when you see the 225, that's out of our Mesa County contribution. Uh, overlays. Uh, this is one of the projects we asked ourselves, you know, what can we realistically get done next year and how can we really get the best bang for our buck, uh, so to speak. So we decided to put a, uh, a lot more money into overlays because this is definitely our preferred method of uh, treating our roads and streets. And also, I think it really benefits the community overall. So you'll see an increase of $260,000 for overlays next year. Um, the streets identified for overlay include um, the ones uh, on the slide, um, Pinion Court, Fremont Street, K.4 Road to L Road, that's that little half street um, we didn't do when we did the sidewalk improvements, K.4 Pine Street to Carlotta Court, and then some stuff along Lexington Way and Concord Drive. Abdu as well. So we actually, this year was unique to where we out, um, contracted out our street evaluation system to a third party contractor and we got the results of that. Our public works team is kind of going through those results. I believe they will be, be presented eventually, but uh, these are the streets that have been uh, designated for overlays based upon the results of that um, uh, uh, survey results from that contractor. Uh, we're also going to do a small sidewalk safety improvement at Paber and Sycamore. Um, there is a small subdivision going in off Paber um, right there. So we've thought um, that this would be a good benefit with that subdivision going in. And the council has also heard about uh, speeding along Paber. So what you see here, this is on Pine and Paber. It won't be it won't look like this, but we'll add a crosswalk. They'll bring in the uh, the sidewalks. Um, add some traffic calming features, and we hope that we'll be able to get that done by summer of 2024 to help with speed, but also pedestrian safety on uh, paper as well. Uh, installation of a self-cleaning restroom in downtown Fruta. Um, so as our special events have continued to grow, even some of our uh, Fruta events like Thursday night concerts, we've recognized that there's a need to have additional bathrooms in downtown. Bless you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, in downtown Fruta as more and more people come to these events. Um, so our Parks and Rec Department has been working on this and they have recommended that we install a self-cleaning bathroom in downtown Fruta. Um, the picture here is one um, that was sent somewhere else. So this is essentially what it looks like. It's built somewhere else and shipped kind of as constructed to the organization and can be placed um, uh, where we decide to put it. Um, so we actually receive a significant amount of cost savings due to that because it's not something that we have to build. We're not paying for any additional building materials. It's already been built um, uh, before it gets shipped. Um, we can also add any kind of artwork we want. The artwork you see on there, I can't really speak to that, but they've said we can add the fruit of gear. Um, we can add whatever this group thinks is appropriate, whatever our parks and rec department thinks is appropriate. Um, <laughs> you have a name already in mind? Yeah. Uh, I'm going to keep my mouth shut first. <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah. So, uh, and you'll see more and more communities are kind of moving to these self-cleaning bathrooms. There's one in uh, Palisade. There's uh, Grand Junction is going to start installing them as well. Um, that's because they're pretty close in cost to just a traditional non-on-made bathroom. So that's why we'd recommend moving forward with that. We have a total cost of three hundred fifty thousand dollars. Two hundred fifty thousand dollars is for the restroom itself. And then we have hundred thousand dollars for uh, any design, utilities, permits, you water tap, and of course our sewer tap because Kimberly will not give me a discount on that. <laughs> Can I ask you a question? Yeah. If what would I know you said something about the cost savings from the yeah. building it? Um, what would it be anticipated if we built that? Just a normal, right? Non automated. Right. Yeah. You know, I think we'll have a really good idea this Friday because um, we are bidding out Reed Park right now, and in there is a bathroom. We have some rough estimates um, from FCI. They think anywhere between two to five hundred thousand dollars, depending upon finishes. Um, kind of what you want to include in there. So we think it's pretty comparable um, to what it would cost, but then you get all these additional benefits, which I'll go over in some of these additional slides from getting the automated bathroom. But yeah, they, we won't, I think Reed Park will give us a good estimate. They delayed that bid because the people that were going to bid requested a delay. Um, but uh, I, two to 500,000 is roughly what FCI gave us. Is that right, Mark? Yeah. yeah. Yep. And have we, uh, do we have a specific locations in mind already or do we know what we have a few we haven't made any decisions i believe we were thinking about the parking lot across from domino's kim's auto without losing any parking spots oh cool. at least i don't think we'd lose any parking spots but we'll we'll play that by ear i, I will say that um it's it's tough to get an exact comparable of a a the and Reed Park will probably be larger than what we would build comparable to this, but it'll give us it'll give us a good example besides estimates and getting the actual um, bids for that uh, that'll be broken down by line items. If you remember when we were on the tour for the riverfront properties, there was a new bathroom being installed. I think it was basalt basalt basalt. and Mark uh, noticed that FCI was building that one, so we got the cost. Now, every facility can have different, you know, additional features and things like that. But that was a fairly small brick building, you know, bathroom. And that was almost, it was just under 900,000? About 800,000, yeah. Oh, 800,000, sorry, 800,000 for that for that facility. Um, well, I don't know if there were, uh, we don't know of any, you know, exceptional additions to it. But uh, uh, one of the things, Shannon's going to go through some of the some of the pros and some of the cons of these, what's leaning towards why we're looking at the self-cleaning versus uh, the traditional. And the range varies so much because of the finishes. So if you're going with stainless steel, so you're avoiding the vandalism of porcelain breaking, if you're going with vandal resistant wall. I mean, there's so many different finishes that will take that price up. So that was one of the things they went with high end finishes architecture the art on the outside of the building it was very extensive and the design for that was pretty substantial so the construction was high but also the finishes made it um that much higher so it's really hard to figure out do you do stick built for a 200 square foot building do you do block what do you do there's so many decisions to be made on what's the most cost effective um but yeah that's that's what gives you that big range a life expectancy on these yeah, that's what I wanted to do. <laughs> on the like, are we talking like manufactured home versus stick belt like what so when I was talking to the manufacturer they're all um they're not proprietary parts so they're Siemens parts that you can get in the U.S. right they're a standard part number that you can go and order it's not something that it's coming from overseas that will are you know hard to get so if a solenoid goes bad um, anything goes bad with this, they, it will actually notify you and let you know what's going on and it will, you can go change that out pretty easy. So I think, uh, overall, I think there's a two-year warranty on the, the parts, um, and the building, I believe had a five-year warranty, um, because it's pre pre-made, uh, in a different location. So we don't know, like, a like for the actual structure itself. So I asked about maintenance fees and asked about when, what others are looking at, because they've been around for a while. And I was like, what are wearing out? What are you seeing? What are you ordering? What are these folks looking for? And they haven't had that yet. 
So they're, they're not wearing out. They're not having major repairs or major fixes. It, Mark, point. you said that they, there's a few that have been doing it for a while. What, what kind of a time span are we talking? Are we saying 10 years? I believe. Yeah. 10 years. So yes. At 10 years, they're still holding that pretty. And, and there's some of the locations that these have been installed are in large festival areas that are seeing a lot of uses and, and they're getting used often. So that's, um, yeah. We're, we're, you're, what we've been seeing them in the past is they're new to this area, like Palisade and the Junction about to put it in, but um, larger cities, California, you know, where there's, uh, they've been tested out for quite, quite some time and in, in over, over the last decade, at least, um, especially in areas where, um, where there is a lot of use and there's where you have to actually have people, you know, lock the physical structures where you have some, some opportunities different with these. Um, and because, uh, because of vandalism and because of some of the, the traditional uses in, in, in your downtown areas with, with restrooms, a lot of them, like where Grand Junction's putting it, they've actually had to keep that normal structure that they're replacing it with, that they've already have, they've had to keep that. You probably noticed over the years locked with porta potties outside, so they're looking at it from a standpoint of this is an opportunity to 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 keep it open and and Shan's going to go through some of those pros in this slide. What you're saying is we probably should let Shannon go through. No, that. no, these are, no. These are great questions. Yeah, it's, this is what's the fruit of lose going to be. <laughs> yeah, great questions and uh, yeah, great information. So yeah, what are the pros of uh, the self cleaning restrooms um, overall? Uh, less water consumption than the non-automated washrooms. Um, it's estimated to use half of the water for flushing and floor cleaning. Uh, the bowl is cleaned every use and floor is cleaned after every 10 to 15 uses. Uh, we also have remote monitoring. So I didn't know this, but apparently at the end of the night, our police officers are actually going and locking all of our bathrooms um, around Fruta. So this can be done remotely. Um, as Mark was discussing, it also will provide you if there's any issues um, with the bathroom, it'll send you notification of that. And hopefully it can be um, uh, fixed remotely. Um, and with that, with less, uh, uh, with the monitoring, there's less daily on-site visits, supervision, and less cleaning and traveling. And also, there's no water heater, so um, that saves some energy costs in the long run as well. There's a heater, but no water heater, so it just puts out the cold water and cleans with the cold water. Um, cons, again, you know, anytime you have a structure or building, it still may require staff cleaning. Um, at times, um, facility could stay wet after cleaning. Um, you always have to worry about potential electronic failures um, uh, in the future. And also, you will probably need some sort of redundant internet to make sure that you don't have any issues uh, with the bathroom. If there were something to go wrong, the internet went out, you'd still have, uh, still have the ability to get noticed or get a notification for that. Um, Generally for cost benefit, we have a cost in there, but since the costs are pretty close, I think we're gonna hold on and hold off on doing a formal cost benefit until we get some better costs. But roughly we anticipate it's the same um, price as the non-automated restrooms. Um, these are numbers straight from the contractor. So based upon 2000 uses per month is estimated we'll save about 57,000 gallons of water per year. Staff time, roughly three to $4,000 a year based upon you know just cleaning, monitoring, um, we'll have the energy savings from having no hot water heater. And also the wrap that you saw is uh, vandalism rated material. So hopefully that will help out with any potential vandalism in the future, which unfortunately that does happen at our parks from time to time. Any other questions on this before moving on to different how it, bathroom? How does it work if someone wants to have a wind-free night? And sleep over like how do how do we stop that before i think it encourages people to turn over because it washes the walls the floor the toilet bowls all as part of itself so as we lock it it's not we'll yeah. know if someone's in there yeah i believe so yeah yeah so it knows when it's empty and is is able to do that <laughs> that's not going to start when yeah. i would be the lucky one <laughs> I, to, well, <laughs> to get washed yeah. well it's cold water yeah. so you don't have yeah. to it has happened to me. I think I was on Palisade. It started on the walls and I was like, what is going on? It's so <laughs> odd. But that's kind of like your cue because then it washes. Oh my gosh. It's been hanging out. Yeah. They're going to be like a sign that says, in case, like, I am one of the lucky who, who was stuck <laughs> at the Wildcat Car Wash. Like, oh, there's yeah. a sign in there that yeah. you can call if you get stuck in there. Oh, yeah. I'm sure <laughs> we can definitely, thing. we can definitely add that. Yes. 
that'd be pretty easy to add. It's fully automatable. So I will make sure that we program that into the, the system. Thanks. 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 I just want to point out, we're talking about having a bathroom requires dual internet connection. Yeah. <laughs> so it it, it, it runs off of lying. one, but I just want to make sure like that something doesn't happen if we don't, you know, it, it, it really just sends you the best part about it, it. It will tell you when toilet paper is out. It will tell you when soap is getting low. It will tell you if there's a solenoid that's not working, like it notifies you, emails you. So you save staff time from going out and checking that. So when we get those requests that, Hey, toilet paper, out for this huge festival we know prior to that and then with the automation it saves on all the materials all the soap all the uses for that so we can program how often it cleans how often it sanitizes how often it's just a cleaner unit you know when we're cleaning right now we could go into the building and the next person that uses it it will be dirty for the rest of the day, not knowing what had happened. So this ensures that after so many uses, it's going to be clean. It, it will provide a better product for, for everyone. And just for pure transparency, and I know the answer is obvious, but just throw it out there. It's just one person unit at it, right? Or... No, this is a dual oh. unit. So this has um, two holes okay. um, and then the the mechanical room. So, okay. yep. so two people can use it. It's... Yep. Great. What's the cost of if the computer goes down? What's the cost of replacement? You know, we don't have that information. I'm sure that's something that we could figure out and get back um, to the council. But I I don't have that information based on the quote that was provided. Mark, do you have I broken don't. down? We don't know. We could get that. That'd be sure. Oh, I'm really struggling with this. Um, next, another restroom. Uh, we do have we may have to go get the screwdriver from across the hall. Uh, $100,000 for the installation of a vault restroom uh, at Snook's Bottom. This is something that we've needed for quite a while. We had to replace the porta potty this past year. And I think this will just be a good addition to Snook's um, uh, as a whole because it's probably something that we've needed. I'm so sorry. This is... <laughs> just, just for the sake of not understanding, what's vault? What is a vault? Uh, it's Oh, oh, so a vault toilet is just, <laughs> it's just a vault. So it, there's no running water or anything like that. So you will have to get that pumped out depending on the usage. So very similar to all the BLM trailheads to, yeah. Yep. Any, anything you'd see, I think Devil's Canyon, vault one, and then everything you see at 18 road. Yeah. Cool. It's hundred thousand dollars. That'll come from our conservation trust funds, which is a good use of those dollars because they're meant for uh, parks, open space and trails. Um, then we have a small building improvements project uh, at the Civic Center, City Shops, and the Fruita Community Center. Um, this is just to install key card access for staff areas at these buildings, but also upgrade the cameras at the community center as well. Um, we have $90,000 total. 60 of that is the general fund contribution for the Civic Center and the City Shops, and 30000 is for the Fruita Community Center. We've had some instances where people walk into staff offices because they're upset. It becomes confrontational, so we're just trying to limit anything that could potentially happen as a safety measure over here and also at the Fruita Community Center. Cool, that is it for our new 2024 capital projects, um, moving into the reappropriate projects. Um, so if nobody has any questions on other, those projects. What's cool. the, this is $90,000 of donation revenue. It's like we had a budget for this year, but it didn't happen. What, what oh yeah, that? yeah, that's a good one. So let me skip over to that. Um, the $90,000 for the design of the Highway 340 underpass trail. Um, if you remember, we were going to design uh, one of two trails for the Carl Riverfront and the Riverfront Commission let us keep $90,000 that they gave us for the Coke Pelly section of the Riverfront Trail, as long as we used it on a Carl Riverfront Trail item. So we uh, budgeted 90000 for the design of a underpass trail at 340 and um, uh, the river, uh, 90,000 wasn't enough for that design, but we went and got $860,000 uh, multimodal options fund grant. So 250 is budgeted for that. I think my last question for capital projects is yeah. on page 342, there's no budget for Reed Park. We yeah. have to roll that over, right? Great question. Yeah. So since we don't know the total, and that is in a future slide as well. 
since we don't know the total, um, we will come back to council at the beginning of the new year, um, assuming the contract has been awarded and we'll reappropriate that. Hey, thanks, Mike. <laughs> Is that a screwdriver? <laughs> Oh, look at that. Look at that. Uh, we will reappropriate that. Um, and council will have to reappropriate that before we can spend those dollars. So that's why you see like a zero dollar amount. Thank you. Uh, quick question. Thank you. Um, you mentioned that Hickenlooper and Bennett uh, had the $1.75 million in their appropriation bill. Do we know when that goes uh, to the house? So it has went to reconciliation. I can't, I can't say for certain because there's a lot of things going on in the United States Congress right now. <laughs> that is yeah, it's working perfect. Yeah, thank you. Um, I want to say by the end of the year, and we did have Congresswoman Bobert here. Um, you no, she wasn't. Yeah, it's was part of that conversation. I just didn't know. If yeah, you hadn't, I hadn't heard. I have not heard, and I have not heard from their staff as well. But we will wait and see. Is there anything in addition that we can do to help uh, keep her focus on that that you can recommend? Because <laughs> uh, I know she's going to make cuts. Oh, the Congresswoman? Yeah. I mean, her, her staff has been great to work with. Same with Ben and Hickenlooper's staff. Um, I really think that's how we got it kind of across just because of the relationships we have with them yeah. over there. So we can definitely ask and they've been pretty good they've said it's by this point it's went through reconciliation they do understand that it will be some cuts um, but this is such a small dollar project compared to what you see for some of the other cds i want to say the centers combined got 172 million last year or something that they feel pretty good about it but we'll keep on uh checking in with them and kind of going from there i was very encouraged um when we met with her and kind of her opinions on potential next year projects. Um, she didn't recommend any this year, but she recommended a lot for her district, which was the first time. So that was good to see, but she didn't make it seem like they would be competitive uh, moving forward next year. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. And thank you, Mike, for the <laughs> screwdriver. Uh, so South Mesa Street will be reappropriated. We have $2.4 million overall. Um, again, since this is CDOT funding, we do have to update our design. So we anticipate the design will be complete by mid 2024. We'll bid it out sometime next year and then construction will take four to six months uh, following that. Uh, 16 road rail crossing. This is one we keep on moving forward every year, um, largely dependent upon the railroad. We hope summer 2024, um, but we will see. And then the design of the Highway 340 underpass trail, as Councillor Hansley mentioned earlier, um, hopefully we'll get that done next year by August 24, and then we can decide how we wanna move forward with that uh, trail. Um, another one that we should be wrapping up, construction is gonna start soon on our lateral connection for the broadband middle mile project. I'm very happy with how this has turned out um, so far. The CNL has been built and will be placed soon if it's not already been placed. Um, at our city shops facility. We do have people building out last mile internet uh, to residents in Fruta. And by this time next year, we will be a gig city and people have access to symmetrical gigabyte internet service um, at homes and at businesses. So very uh, happy to see that and happy to see that uh, we'll join all the other communities and have uh, gig options uh, for uh, residents and businesses. So will that help with the automated bathroom? <laughs> I hope so, yeah. Ironically, um, we're... <laughs> that's right. <laughs> Go fast. We'll get there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That, that's a good point. Yeah. And we're, we're eventually going to create like a loop of fiber to all of our city facilities. And one part we'd like to hit is downtown Fruta. So we'll have fiber all along downtown Fruta. We'll probably own that as part of the middle mile. I'd love to put some access points out there eventually too, but right now we get this piece done and then we can kind of go from there. Um, this again is funded mostly through uh, a grant from the Colorado Department of Local Affairs, but also the uh, ARPA funds that we received that were specifically allowed for broadband. But to add what Shannon's uh, talking about in discussions with these groups and as we build the CNL and as, as, uh, private groups build the last mile. Um, we have we are looking at what costs are to to bring one. We are working on for all of our facilities because we have a we have a current fiber connection, um, but it's old fiber. It needs it needs an upgrade. We've we've known that for a number of years. 
Uh, we'd like to create more of a loop to have better redundancy for, and when we say our facilities, it includes the Lower Valley Fire and the police department and the community center, this building, city shops, and then making sure that our wastewater reclamation facility has a good connection. Um, but as Shannon was mentioning, we're also looking at how we, in, in the process of doing that, we can bring more wireless internet to certain areas public areas of the city. So where there are some wireless options. So we're looking at what that what what those costs would be or how that could be built in, uh, negotiated in. When you think about some of the, the larger parks, uh, some of the downtown area, things like that, especially where we have a lot of events, Reed Park, for example, when you have all these vendors, all these vendors now, and this is not the only reason, just for residents when they're out, you know, in open space to have that connection is, is, a, is a benefit. But um, at all these vendors now are working with wire, you know, wireless payment systems and all those types of things. I mean, we have big events in the downtown. They're trying to get on F Works or this building's, you know, they're they're anything they could best slope, any anything they can grasp just to be able to take payments. And uh, so it kind of is it's good timing and working with them to be able to figure out future locations so we've we've given them a pretty detailed map to get get the costs and and there's also a lot of grant funding for broadband like we're utilizing for this project but to do expansion pieces to go after as well um, but like the the beach property that we just toured making sure that future locations and working with these providers as well separately from our system but where new development will be occurring so that they're planning to reach out to those neighborhoods and build out to those as well. So there, there's a lot of things going on with, in addition to, and being looked for and funding options for um, to build upon even just what we're, the current project that we have right now. Mike, I want to ask, I guess something that maybe to research would be, like we were talking about like vendors coming in town, is there a way with that wireless to say, okay, there's a fee associated with using it for this, these two days. I mean, cause you, you're charging extra for electric when people come and right, charge right. for those extra amenities, mm -hmm. you know? Um, so it might be something to, to look at helping pay for. Can we do like hotels do where you got like one, you can log on and use it at a certain level, but if you right. want to pay for like a right. higher yeah. level. Well, I've got a kind of a bigger, higher level question with that. Are we looking at the city providing that internet service or are we looking at a private business prov providing that service? Because I do know in some states there are legal issues around that. Yeah, we're not looking at being the provider, but often in Colorado uh, where private providers provide internet to the city, they'll provide like at the community center I mean, or like at this building, any, anybody from the public can get on wireless for free. We don't charge for that. Um, so doing that in some of our park spaces and some of our open spaces, yeah. but, but there are options that you can consider, such as council member Williams has, has stated where you can, you can look at different levels or how, how much you're, what you're offering. Cause at this building in particular, we got members of the audience that come to these meetings, they can get on the public without a password, but to get on a little bit faster, more secure network, there's certain passwords and, and certain things like that. So it, it's mainly for that, not being a provider, not not necessarily selling it to businesses in any way. I, I, I wasn't talking about that. I do know there are some legal issues about providing free Wi-Fi in parks and downtown areas. Yeah, and to piggyback off something Mike said, you know, we will continue to look for um, grant programs that can help out with that. There is a ton of grant funding that's available right now through both federal and state agencies that we are um, researching as much as we can. This is a spreadsheet that we have. This is actually provided by the state. I want to share this. This is all IJA, which is the Infrastructure Investment Jobs Act, and also the IRA, the Inflation Reduction Act grants that have come out. This is 400 lines of grants programs that we go through in our downtime um, just to see <laughs> just to see what might be good fits. And I'm not just like not just like 19 Road. I don't go through all this and like I'm looking for something specifically for 19 Road, but researching these grants, like what would be a good fit for Fruta overall um, as a whole. One that's come up recently is the Car Energy Office provides like building audits. Um, test your windows, test all of that. We think it'd probably be very appropriate for this building to do that. But we're slowly going through this. This is a long list. Setting ourselves up for failure. Well, <laughs> then assuming there's gaps, they help you fund improvements in the future. Um, 
like this tighter. <laughs> yeah, but no, we've been spending a lot of time. This spreadsheet is is funny because there's 400 lines. You total up this. This is 880 billion dollars with the grants fund that are currently available. So we're trying to work through as fast as we can, but unfortunately, it's just something that we have to take some time and go through. <laughs> yeah. Cool. Uh, our last capital project is Reed Park, as Councillor Hansi asked. Thank you for that question. Um, I thought you were saying we're done with capital projects. Oh, no. In the question. <laughs> oh, so yeah, like, oh, yeah. I got to get my question. Oh, of course. Yeah. Yeah. This Apologies for ju jumping. Carry on. Yeah. Carry on. <laughs> um, bid is set to close this Friday. So that's why you see a dollar amount, a zero dollar amount in there. Uh, council will eventually approve the contract for Reed Park and then we'll reappropriate it next year um, as well. I think that's kind of just cleaner. Mm -hmm. um, last year, I put some in there where we, thought we knew the final cost then we had some things come in late so then we had to do a reduction in appropriations it's probably just cleaner if you guys reappropriate it at the start of the new year okay that is it for capital projects if we don't have any other questions anybody have any questions on capital i just wanted to comment one more time on sure. the on the internet stuff and the public oh, yeah. usage i i do really like that you guys are looking into that and i and i would really like to continue that like kind of like the same vein of where we did the charging stations. Right. I could see 10, 15 years from now, that's just going to be a normal thing. Oh yeah. So we definitely want to be ahead of that curve. So I appreciate you guys really yeah. digging in on that. That's, that's good ideas. Yeah. appreciate it. And yeah, we're, we're super excited that all of this is kind of coming to uh, fruition as well, because it's something we've talked about for a while. And now we have, uh, you know, contractors, private companies in here, you know, putting in that service and also others that want to come in as well. So I think it just ultimately leads to a better product uh, for our residents and for our businesses. So thank you. I, yeah. And I just wanted to add about Reed Park and and maybe apologize if you covered it when I was getting this really good toolkit here. Um, <laughs> the, uh, uh, you know, the original bid opening was, was supposed to be the 13th and that, that got extended one week because when we had, Prior to a bid opening, you typically have um, a, a scheduled time where people ask questions. And fortunately, we're getting a lot of interest. And some of those questions were pretty technical related to uh, engineering and, and all that. So when we gave that information back, we realized that the turnaround time with that new information would be too short to meet like the Friday with those clarifications that were asked. So we extended it one week so that we because our, our goal is to get the best bids we have that we're not having to, you know, and then we sort through them. So yeah, I apologize if that was covered, but um, uh, anyway, that, that that's why we extended one week. Uh, we're excited to get that one open so we can find out some real time frames, some real costs, uh, make those adjustments and get that project moving is, is our hope. So. Great. Uh, core service and delivery, this just touches upon some highlights um, regarding the community goals, but also kind of trends we're seeing across all funds. Um, as we were discussing earlier, uh, the number one and number two priority for residents is to continue to improve our uh, quality of city streets and also limit traffic congestion. So we do spend a lot of money on street and sidewalk projects. Um, in the 2024 budget, you'll see this um, not just in capital projects, but in our public works general fund as well. We have a total of $150,000 for sidewalk improvements. That does include that paper and sycamore improvement, but just $100,000 to continue our sidewalk replacement program, which has been a great success. We have $210,000 for chip sealing. Um, this is an increase of $60,000 from the prior year, but this is to double chip seal South 19 Road on the south side of the interstate because um, desperately needs that. Uh, each year we spend about $72,000 on street striping as well, so we will continue that into next year. And we have $85,000 set aside for miscellaneous patching repairs of our roads um, and bridges uh, any time throughout the year. Uh, on the patches uh, and repairs, though, yeah. that we do we contract that out or is our staff? Do uh, I think it kind of depends on what it is. A lot of things like we can probably do on our own, but a lot of the stuff too, we do contract chip sealing. We just um, did it jointly with Mesa County street striping. Um, we contracted out this year, I'm pretty sure. So it kind of just depends on what exactly it is and kind of staff time, staff expertise for some of that stuff. Yeah. I think we do a lot in house of those miscellaneous repairs and the patching. I, I would like, I think this is good for just a little bit of his not far far back historical but our recent history um we uh, we used to receive from mesa county 
either a hundred thousand or two hundred thousand a year that we would that we would combine with a hundred thousand or two hundred thousand that the city had, and that would go towards things like overlays. And I'm looking at Margaret because she was she was more uh, familiar with that. And then it kind of started fading out, and then we no longer have received that for a number for um, probably the last five years, I believe, somewhere around that. Um, at the time, then we then we do those surveys, and every surveys had the same kind of results, right? Like um, we've had, fortunately, we've had very positive results and high and high ratings in our service delivery and those types of things. But we always ask that other question of where would you like us to prioritize funds if we're able to put funds to other play, uh, other things? And and roads is always uh, streets and roads always always the top by far, and. What we, some of you will remember, um, uh, you know, a handful of years ago as we were losing that money for Mesa County and we were trying to, at the same time, we're seeing that that kind of feedback. Um, there were a few years where, in essence, if you if you follow the numbers, we were falling, we, we weren't in, increasing and we were, we were staying flat or decreasing slightly. Um, fortunately, uh, we've, the last couple of years we've been able to put a little bit more but the, but now we're kind of getting back to that a higher level where sometimes it's better to do more projects at once um, than than just a few each year um, but at the same time we're trying to get to a level where we're keeping all the roads at a certain level continuously so you know you're always maintaining roads at different times um, I I look forward to we will have a presentation for you all related to once we have the final, we had hoped that it would completely be done. We're just trying to go through the edits and things like that um, from the company that we paid this year. Um, we were pleasantly surprised just in general. Um, we, were, we had a little bit of a worry. We've been doing it on our own. Is it gonna come back and it's gonna show most of our roads? But but um, we're in a we're in good shape. But that but that that ends quickly if we don't keep up with it. Um, so uh, we're we're finally with this budget, and I would say this year's budget as well, getting back to where we're putting in a significant uh, you know a, a significant amount that if we keep up with that, we're doing really well on those ratings. Um, but we had a few years where we weren't you know we were uh, we were struggling to. Um, because when you were used, when we were used to maybe four hundred thousand, and we were only paying two hundred thousand of that, it was, we had to start making up for that. Anyway, great. Thanks, Mike. Um, other trends across all funds. Um, you will notice there is a new line item in our budget this year. It's called software subscription. Um, we are held to standards by the government accounting standards boards and every once in a while they release, uh, uh guidance and basically we have to adopt standards from them. And one of the new ones that was, uh, implemented last year is that we have to now, um, account for what's called inter or service-based IT agreements separately in our financial statements or SPEDAs is what they like to call them. Um, so basically that's any... Yeah. Um, that's any sort of internet technology agreement where we lease, you know, the software from them for less than a year. So your Adobe creative cloud, um, geez, I can't think of more off the top of my head. We have several, uh, Adobe creative crowd, Granicus, um, our, our, uh, some of our planning software as well, cloud permit. Um, we have to account for those separately in our budget. In the past, those have been put in a line item called service contracts. So you'll see service contracts decrease significantly and you'll see that software subscriptions increase um, quite a bit. I can show you like a super quick example if this group is interested in one. Okay, let me pull up my budget um, and you'll see I- too. Yeah. <laughs> Don't worry, okay. we all knew that you would yeah, do it. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. Hey, here's our updated budget. Um, so <laughs> this was just uploaded last week. Um, as always, we spend a ton of time um, adding bookmarks, so please use those so our time is not wasted. Um, I can pull up a few. Yep, yep. So just in our finance department, let me scroll down. Um, also for every department, every program we have, the last four years, we have mission, goals, performance measures, responsibilities, all of that. And we actually provide our line item budgets. Um, yeah, so right here, you'll see service contracts was 28,650. It's now down to $8,000, but the, yeah, yeah. Um, but then the software subscriptions, 
is 41,000. There is a $10,000 difference there. It's because we're upgrading our accounting system as the city council is already approved. Um, so you'll see this there. I categorize them. You have 4,300 level expenses, which is these first two numbers, purchase professional services compared to purchase property services, 4,400. So you'll see some differences there. Shannon, you're saying we're paying a little bit more now to update, but that yeah. budget line item will, won't stay 41,000. Uh, that will be our new costs. That's for our accounting software. Yeah, we're moving to a cloud base. We've had a lot of issues with our current version, um, but that also includes some other software to like uh, manage our leases, stuff like that. So it's not all that, but yeah, I think that'll be a good um, a good uh, uh, transition for our finance department um, that, next year. That's a good. That's a good point to make. Is that you'll see two things with those. One, there's a new line item, and then so you're essentially changing from one line item to another and you have those changes but then there's new software that we're that we're adding in right so we're the financial systems new so that that's an increased cost we have a new system for municipal court we have a new yeah. system for uh short term rentals we have the new system that actually was in this year's but you know continues for planning and development um I'm probably missing another but it's amazing how many subscription what yeah, sorry the, the class. yeah um yeah our website uh the, all the things that are tied to muni code which is not only the website but it's it's when you want to see all the meeting agendas uh minutes packets how we put the agendas together is a system where everybody can do the reviews separately you know that for many years we were doing the emailing cover sheets and right. you know shared folders so um super helpful really save a lot of time but it is a big, you know, as you go, you know, it's a, you know, these are ongoing expenses for ongoing services and, 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 and work we've been doing. It builds an efficiency. It does. People it, do other it stuff. does. They're, yeah. they, you know, they've been great. We've, we've had certain services for many years. I mean, work order systems and all those types of things, but um, so you'll see too, right. There's increases based on the new, the new softwares, and then there's the, the flip-flop of a, of a line item of, of the ones we've already had. And it's just another line item accurately or more um, accurately represents kind of what we're paying for certain things. So that's always never a bad thing as well. Um, I caveat this next one. Inflation is slowly slowing down. Um, the state provides an inflation estimate for the end of the year each year. This is done by two agencies the uh, Carow Legislative Council and also the Carow Office of State Planning and Budgeting. Um, for the past several years, we've seen some pretty significant um, inflation um, increases. Last year ended at 8% overall. Um, this year, they're predicting an increase of 5%, which is down from 8% last year. Um, but this is also up from March when they thought initially uh, inflation would be about 4.3%. So it's slowly creeping up. Um, so we are still seeing increased costs for normal services, goods, um, all of that as well, but it's not as significant as it has been in the past. Um, other trends you might see, supply and utility costs. I'm sure everyone remembers in February when they got their gas bill, um, how significant that was. Um, Kimberly and I were actually just going through our utility expenses. We paid $17,000 of our $85,000 budget for gas um, in February this year. Um, so you'll see some increases in our supply utility costs, but we do expect those to hopefully flatten out um, in the future, especially now that hopefully some of that uh, issues with gas and Excel are um, uh, alleviating. And also personnel data, which uh, Mike has already shared with uh, this group. Um, we saw an eight and a half percent market increase in our car municipal league data. Again, hearing from other government agencies, it's kind of, it seems like this could be the last year we'll see 8%. It's closer to four or five moving forward. So yeah, those are kind of just trends we're seeing across all funds that impact our ability to provide core services. Questions on that before I move over to enterprise funds? All right, seeing none. Um, we have a few enterprise funds to cover. Um, just as a reminder for this group, our enterprise funds are funds that are funded mostly through user fees and by law cannot be subsidized more than 10% per TABOR. Um, so this is stuff where you know people get a service and in exchange for that service, they pay a fee. 
Um, so our trash fund, irrigation fund, sewer fund as well. Uh, so starting off with the trash fund, uh, we do have $1.2 million in revenue and expenses um, for next year. Um, as per our contract with waste management, uh, they do allow for a inflation adjustment each year. So the inflation for last year was 6.7%. Um, down from, I think we had an 18% increase last year. So that's uh, good to see that we're not seeing such significant jumps. Um, so about 7% increase, but then in 2024, we have three new programs. And also in 2023, we have the spring cleanups, not new, but it's one we will continue to do has been a great benefit to the community. We have our leaf pickup, which is starting this November. We actually just got the dates today. So I sent them over to Ciara. Um, see if there's any issues with those dates. We have two in November, one in early December. So hopefully that'll kind of cover all of the period of leaves. And then they will also provide us with a holiday dumpster um, or a dumpster after the holidays for any additional trash that they may have. No questions on trash fund. I can move on to irrigation fund or Councillor Hansi. Trash. Sure. Why are, why are we showing a 2% decrease in certain um, revenues and expenses in the trash fund. Trash fund? Mm. I would anticipate that it's yeah, that should be going up. That should be an increase. Then, like the sewer you have going up three percent. Yeah, and you you'd expect that the sewer or the trash fund would be oh yeah consistent with that. It looks like we're just showing twenty four budget the same as the twenty three budget, but um, twenty three is going to be bigger than both. Let me double Age check. 406. Oh, yeah. So, oh, I yeah. do apologize. This, let me double check this. Oh, so my apologies. This graph right here was not updated, which happens when you're rushing to get this done. Um, before you go on paternity leave. And, and this line item graph was updated. So the line item graph is correct, but the summary graph uh, is not. So we'll get that updated in future uh, graphs. Apologize about that. Oh, so 410 is a better reflection, which yep, yep. makes much more sense. That's yep. a percent increase. Yep. Seven percent increase. We generally round those up. We also have 500 or not 500. Yeah. $500 in single use bag fees. If you guys have any ideas for that, we can always discuss that at a later date. <laughs> I'm going to drop the maternity leave. Right. <laughs> Sorry. Get you but, <laughs> hey, I gotta use what I have, you know. I was <laughs> I was rushing to get this done, so I apologize. Uh irrigation fund, no rate of sleep didn't yeah. at all. Uh irrigation fund, no rate changes in 2024. Um, really no revenue changes as well. We do have a 2% increase in uh, expenses, uh, mostly due to the purchase of capital equipment, which is the irrigation trash cleaners, which is replacing the two we have, um, which removes debris from the uh, GVIC main irrigation canal before the water enters the Fruta system. Sorry, can you go back one slide? Sure. Thank you. Yeah, no worries. Any other questions on irrigation? Why are we going down on salaries? Uh, you know, that it's one down everywhere is going up. Yep. Eight, 10, 13, 11%. This yeah. is going down 11. Yeah, that's a good question. So we actually um, had a few salary changes and we had some personnel changes. We had employees that were assigned to the irrigation fund. Um, Prior to, we hired a new maintenance worker last year. So we actually went down on overall hours for the irrigation fund and their time was reassigned to the sewer uh, fund and also uh, mountain water as well. So it, it is showing a decrease in salaries, but um, that's just because the salaries have been assigned to other funds. We have some employees, they, their time gets charged to three different funds. So like in our utility department, they may um, have funds associated with the irrigation fund, but then they may also um, have some of their salary charged to sewer but then they may also have some charge to the general fund. Like Kimberly's is a great example, 49% general fund, 49% sewer, 2% irrigation. Anything you're capturing things good for going yeah. or just with, especially like looking at overtime, yeah. it looks like you have fun going up and down between a thousand and 6,000 bucks. It seems like yeah. every year and, and you're bringing that back down. Just yeah. That's always kind of dependent upon 
kind of issues we see last year was especially a really bad year uh, for irrigation. Um, so it is something we could um, definitely uh, bump up. I'll have to look at that estimate again. But yeah, it's kind of just varies based upon the, the quality of water that we're seeing. And this year was especially bad, especially the start of the year with all that snow melt. Yeah. And I will like definitely a lot of credit to our public work staff. Like last year, they engineered this um, fan looking thing that scrapes um, kind of all the water going into some of the canals that's helped out a lot, but it kind of just depended upon some of the water we're getting from GBIC, which is the uh, Grand Valley Irrigation Company. Good question. Yeah. Cool. Uh, my last uh, fund to cover tonight is the sewer fund. Um, overall, we see a we will see a decrease in revenue and expenses um, due to the completion of one-time projects out at the plant. Um, I put great job public works because um, although we're not done yet, hopefully we'll be done soon. We are crossing off a number of projects out the plant that need to be done for a while. And we're finally getting those wrapped up. The biggest one being the H2S uh, project. We replaced several manholes and uh, collection lines that have been deteriorated uh, due to H2S gas going out to the plant. Uh, that project has come along very well. We also completed the aeration or will complete the aeration project um, before the end of the year, which will allow us to operate both ditches at the plant at the same time for when capacity does reach that much to where we have to do that. Um, I think that's between the two, three, a little over $3 million in projects we will complete this year. And a lot of that was funded through grants and ARPA funds. So you'll see decreases in overall expenses and revenues just due to completing those. I, I will say these aren't the most fun projects or probably the ones we, uh, you know, that get as much attention, um, but there's a huge relief. <laughs> I, I think uh, Kimberly and, and I and, and many. Uh, <laughs> That's a good one. Uh, huge relief. I love Huge it. relief for uh, the H2S project to be wrapping up. Um, two Saturdays ago, we had, uh, it's a contracted project, but uh, to do that, uh, yeah, you've seen some of the pictures in the weekly update of these massive manholes, but from the the major lift station, what we call the I-70 lift station, that's kind of at the crossroads of the Riverfront Trail and the Little Salt Wash Trail, or right near there, um, that pumps all the sewage, you know, to the the uh, from Fruta to the wastewater reclamation facility. And all those manholes going going up were replaced, and um, and this has been years in the making. Uh, I mean, we've been dealing with how to adequately address the H two S levels, um, and and it because it's not just an easy fix. We've we've had to do pilot studies. We've had to do um, multiple uh, engineering groups. Uh, we've had come in and and you know do with the pilot studies and then and then fully engineer how to how to deal with this um while they were replacing all the manholes we had to um create a i'm forgetting the word here uh, we had to bypass the all this all the sewage um from that main line and two saturdays ago um even though it's contracted we had our crews go in uh, from midnight to 3 a.m. to help make sure that, that that bypass was was they were able to stop the bypass and get it back into the the new lines. And uh, so when some of us were at that religious freedom thing, you know, I had found out that early that morning, you know, Kimberly didn't wait. So 3 a.m. I got the text, but uh, <laughs> the, we were uh, the which I was happy to get. We uh, we knew that the bypass was done. And, and you know, so. There's been, uh, I know Kimberly's had a lot of sleepless nights. I'm sure Terry has and some of our collections, but it's, uh, you know, it was a, it was a big issue, the, the levels of H2S, but to be able to address it and finally see it kind of coming to completion. And the, the group that we contracted has done a phenomenal job. They've been on schedule and it's been one of the, um, well, it's been long in the making to start this final project. This final project has, has, has moved along, um, a little bit faster and just as, as we had hoped. So that it's been great. So when will we know like a, a monitor or monitoring of the levels in there where they should be? I mean, or yeah, 
That's that's one thing we were just talking about that and kind of looking looking ahead. I, I don't have the the final answer yet, but we were just having that discussion because we still need to. They get uh, there's still some things to wrap up, and then there was the the component that's a part of the plant that was added as well to do. Um, I guess would you call it aeration or the bio? Yeah, the the filter. Um, so there's always levels of H2S and that's normal, but what, once we have that functioning over a period of time, we'll be able to monitor and then see, you know, how those levels are changing, how successful it is. Yeah. The other, the other part is even with the levels, our old manholes were concrete. And so, um, when they removed them, they started to crumble. I mean, it was, it was pretty, pretty pretty bad. Fortunately, they were intact enough as, as while they were there, but the new are PVC. And so they don't, they're not susceptible to the gas. Um, so there's a lot of benefit in the long run with the new system that we have compared to the old system, but we do want to monitor those and make sure that it's functioning well. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Super happy with how that turned out. We were bypass pumping 800,000 gallons of sewer a day. Thank so, you for your diligence no, I, in that. Yeah. <laughs> Great to have those uh, wrapped up soon and uh, have those. Uh, of course you do. <laughs> <laughs> that seems like a lot. But... <laughs> uh, revenues for the sewer fund, we have $5.4 million. Again, this is a decrease of 32% compared to estimated actuals. This is just due to the completion of those projects. Expenses, 5.2 million, a decrease of 26% overall. You'll see a um, surplus in the sewer fund, mostly because uh, we had to pull from the reserves restricted for equipment at the plant this year um, to replace the vertical drum mixers. So we'll slowly start repaying, not slowly, we'll probably be done in two years, start repaying the reserves that we pulled from to replace those uh, vertical drum mixers at the plant. So that money will go into uh, reserves, the excess. Uh, 3% rate increase is budgeted for next year. Um, this is one of the graphs that we like to point the community to whenever they have questions about their sewer. Um, this is basically how much your monthly fee and what does it pay for out at the, uh, uh, as far as sewer. Um, the biggest one uh, expense there, you have 15 of your 52, 55 goes to treatment, 15% or seven and a half dollars goes to collections, uh, 789 or $8 goes to capital. Uh, five dollars for administration, but then a third of this goes to uh, debt service because we are still paying on the debt of that facility. We'll be paying on it until 2032. Um, overall, uh, decreased revenues just due to the completion of the capital projects and also usage of grant funds as well. When that debt is paid off, what does that do to that fee? Yeah, well, we'll decide then. Yeah, I think um, we do have a lot of needs out there. We're also looking to how we can fund other capital projects that are on the needs assessment. Um, so we'll look into that, but I can't necessarily say definitively now, but it's probably a discussion we'll have in the future. Yeah. Uh, next year, uh, Kimberly is wasting no time and we're continuing on finishing up with a number of key sewer projects. Uh, we have three total projects totaling $1.5 million. We also have 272,000 in capital equipment, miscellaneous capital equipment for our collections and our uh, reclamation facility. Uh, the first uh, one is the replacement of the Kingsview lift station at $260,000. Um, that's been uh, uh, deteriorating for the last couple of years, so it's probably due for replacement. So next year will be when we'll have budget to make that. We do have about, I want to say, four to $500,000 left of ARPA funds, so we'll use 260 of those for the specific projects. If if you remember, we don't have to spend those dollars uh, until the end of, I think, 2026, so we have to have them appropriated and designated by the end of 2024. Uh, our biggest project next year is to start the replacement of the downtown service area sewer line. Um, this includes the installation of a new 15 or 18 inch PVC sewer line from Greenway Drive, boring under the railroad into a new manhole in downtown. Um, this will be a phase project just due to the size of the project. So right now we have a million dollars set aside in the budget that's split between energy impact grants and also funds that we get for investment fees. And so anytime someone pays a sewer tap, we budget those separately so we can use them for when we need to expand the sewer line or expand capacity at the plant. I'll just add in that there's this could be one that we talk about a little bit more as as we proceed. Um, obviously, uh, we're going after a DOLA grant, uh, but 
if we have savings in some of these other sewer projects and we have some of those ARPA funds that we're able to, to increase our match and ask for more from DOLA, because we're not asking for the maximum as we have budgeted right now. But if we have those savings of funds that can basically be used for sewer projects, we could we could do a longer stretch of that because that, this will be a multi-phased approach um, for that sewer. So just a heads up that th just depending on how some of those um, sewer funds uh, play out, which could go either way, but if they're if we're on the on the better side and we can add more to that match, we could be requesting more from DOLA and increasing that budget only if there's savings from other other projects. Yeah, and this is a map kind of showing this is this uh, square right here um, is where we'll add the new sewer line. You'll go under the railroad tracks um, and then how far it will go. The downtown line is probably where we need the bulk of our replacements left. We do have some Orangeburg still um, in there as well, which is susceptible to the uh, to the H2S gas. Um, so kind of see the phased approach and kind of what will be included in future budgets as part of this project. That's a tear up the street, not a directional boring project, correct? Kimberly? Yep, 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 most likely. Uh, this is the service area for the sewer line replacement. So you kind of see um, pretty big service area for this specific sewer line. Um, it goes, yeah, a lot of uh, downtown. I believe that's Pine Street right here. And then over here to uh, 6 and 50, over to Triangle Park. Uh, last one, rolling forward, the replacement of the sewer line along South Mesa. This is an Orangeburg line. Um, so we have $240,000 uh, as part of this project. Um, and again, that will bid sometime next year. It's continued from this prior year and construction will probably take four to six months, um, but we'll get that replaced with a new updated sewer line. And hopefully we won't have any issues with that um, as far as H2S gas uh, in, the, in the future. Uh, Mr. Mayor, City Council, that concludes my presentation. Always happy to answer any questions you may have. Do you have any questions that they haven't already asked? Yes. Um, yeah. Are we talking public works tonight? Yeah. Yeah. We breeze through that fast. Um, with the sewer fund before we go to uh, public works, I'm, is there a reason why salaries are only up five and four percent? In the sewer fund? Um, is that similar to the trash? I yeah. just want to make sure that we were not. Yeah, yeah. I'd have to check. Um, we did have some retirements um, this year. So generally when it comes to personnel, I budget how much um, the new how much those positions are making. We do have more maintenance workers uh, that have been hired compared to our traditional heavy equipment operators. So with that, there comes some um, salutary or salutary, that's not a word, um, salary <laughs> adjustments um, to where they might be lower. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. I'm just winging it up here, um, but I'd have to check. So for every every time we hire someone, I input their current rate, um, their health insurances, any allowances that they have as far as taxes and whatnot. Um, and sometimes that will bring down um, the benefit expenses if we're replacing people that have been with this city for a while. We've had some long-term retirements recently. Our public works superintendent was with the city for, I believe, over 20 years. Um, we've had some crew leaders retire recently, and we also have had a difficulty fill those higher level roles like the um, uh, the heavy equipment operators. So we're hiring maintenance workers two or one and twos to hopefully eventually promote to those roles. So yeah, the salary is really dependent upon kind of who's in place. So that may fluctuate a few percentage points because of that. Um, last question of the sewer before I move to public works. Sure. On page 397, it looks like we have negative interest. Oh, I'd love to know how you figure that out. That'd be awesome. <laughs> is that the debt? Yeah, it's on the debt. We've got some negative interest. Um, we have interest income happening. Three ninety seven. Oh, this is uh, based upon the refinancing of the loans. Um, yeah, so when we refinanced the loans, we actually saved a lot based upon the initial interest. So I think this is just the difference uh, between the two from our in initial interest amount, principal amount compared to when we refinanced it, which I think was two years ago. Um, so it decreases our overall payment, uh, total payment for the upcoming years. Margaret, you want to add anything to that? You'll have to go to the microphone. <laughs> 
when the authority, I hope I don't mess that up. <laughs> You're brave. <laughs> don't touch the microphone. Don't worry. Don't um, worry. I'm here. <laughs> when the authority refinanced the bonds that underlined this loan, um, when we redid our debt service schedule, they did not reduce the principal amount. What they did was resulting in a credit in the interest at the end of the term of the loan. So that's how you see that negative. Thanks, Margaret. Yeah, you said it better. <laughs> um, onto the public works. I think I just have a few questions here. Of course. Um, mountain water. Not that it's a whole lot. I'm just curious with with all the yeah we've had. You this year you're looking to spend around twenty four thousand. Next year forty over forty thousand. Yeah, a lot of that is due to um uh, uh pipe repair for Enoch Lake. Um, so we didn't have that included in this year's budget, uh, cause we weren't sure where we were going to go, uh, with that. But, um, if there's no changes to Enoch Lake, we do need to budget. I think it's about $10,000, no, $12,000 on water line repair for Enoch and also, um, some capital equipment as well, but that will definitely spend. We didn't spend as much this year cause we were kind of waiting to see what would happen with the mountain water properties. But I think next year we have 10 of that $12,000 just designated for Enoch Lake. And then it looks like we're going up a, a, oh, ahead with uh, maintenance. Work oh yeah. On. Yeah. yeah. Um, is that where we were taking the two seasonal? Yeah. Have you guys done a, an analysis that we asked for? Yeah. Um, so yeah, that was something I was going to cover during personnel, but we can definitely. Oh, that's if, um, if you cover want. To, oh no, no, yeah, I'm I'm super happy. Yeah. So we have, uh, in Parks and Rec, this is happening in Parks and Rec, and in Public Works, we do have a number of seasonal and permanent part-time positions. We've been having difficulty filling those seasonal positions this year, so Public Works requested that we convert um, two of the seasonal positions to a full-time to help with recruitment and um, filling that role. Generally, we budget, I want to say, twenty-five to 30000 for seasonals. They don't get benefits. They just work um, uh, 40 hours a week for six months. So it's about um, 1,040 hours. Um, so about 50,000 for a total cost of the two seasonals, 50 to 60, depending upon what they're hired at. Um, but we're replacing that with one full-time maintenance worker, which is, will probably cost us about 60,000. Always depends on benefit allowance. Um, for our health insurance, we, it varies like our lowest cost health insurance. If it's just employee only costs $9,000. Whereas if you have a family health insurance, it costs the city $23,000. Um, so it kind of just varies on some of their elections, but, uh, yeah, I think at the end of the day, it'll probably cost us additional 20, $25,000, but it will help with much needed recruitment. We've been down people in public works and in parks kind of all year. So you've probably seen, um, some gaps because of that, but I think, being able to offer someone full-time job, being able to offer someone benefits because we do have very competitive benefits will help fill that role. Great. I would just add in, it's, it's definitely not a just this year um, challenge. It's kind of been, I would say about since the, since the pandemic started, maybe the year prior, we were seeing a little bit of it. We've always seen a bit because we'll get people that we'll get some great workers, but if they can get a more permanent job somewhere, then, then we might not get them for the whole season. But Definitely since the pandemic, we've been kind of waiting it out thinking, because ideally it, were, it worked great when we had, you know, a uh, certain amount of seasonals that we could work 40 hours for six months. And then, um, uh, but every year we just keep running into more of those issues, which then puts people into overtime or starts burning people out or so. We're definitely feeling like we've, we've, I think we, we did a conversion in one of those areas that I think in parks are already in the past, but, um, but yeah, we're, we're seeing this as a, a more attainable way to actually have people working. We have made some changes, not, I know this is different from, from your question, but you know, one of the changes we had this year, uh, was one of the duties that we had seasonals doing for, for examples in parks, um, not public works, but used to be, you know, really uh, picking up trash at all the different locations. And we, we moved that from, uh, we changed that to a contracted service because it, 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 we can, we can spend more time with the people we have on the things that require more training and longevity. And then, and that's actually been working really well. So we've been trying to be creative at different ways to handle and what's best and um, uh, 
but yeah, I think you answered the the, the other part already. So yeah, we're not a. Oh, go ahead. It was just interesting to that post COVID. Yeah, hiring is a lot different than pre, and and I'm seeing it in my in my consulting, uh, personally, and it's interesting. It's like really, there's that big yeah. of a difference, but it it is. I see it in my clients as well. Yeah, absolutely. And we're not actually that it's sustaining, right? Like it's kind of one of those, is this going to be an anomaly for a year or two? But I mean, yeah, it's continuing. Going three yeah. years later and it's, yeah. 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 And we're not afraid to like try something different too. Um, Mark and I definitely laugh about this. We converted a seasonal to permanent part-time last year and now we're converting permanent part-time to seasonal next year. <laughs> Just because people, they I mean, do they want to work year round at less than 30 hours a week or do they want to work for six months at 40 hours and get a second job that's similar? And after that, it just kind of varies upon who's interested in those positions at the time. There isn't a lot of budgetary impact to that. There's some, but it's pretty minimal. Um, but we can't be like afraid to try different things to help with our staffing needs, I feel like. Good. I'm just curious, uh, street light and repair and improvements. We're just oh, yeah. 15 grand versus yeah. we spent hundreds of dollars in the past we have been told by our good friends at the car department of transportation that we need to replace a street light that was hit along i-70 and repair it so that's the bulk of that expense yeah oh, we oh we, the one that was laying there for yep. a long 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 time <laughs> it's our responsibility i'm very familiar with that one <laughs> yay uh, it's our responsibility but yay for it being replaced <laughs> so we will replace it i mean it is low dollar I mean, not low dollar, but it is something that we're, we weren't quite sure about whose jurisdiction that is, but. That was something we learned, we not learned. necessarily anticipated. Originally. It's, not, I but yeah. it's but, not our right away, but we, but we do have to, yeah, we did not, we, yeah, we had to, we had to really look into that to figure out if, if that was the case, but it is. So are they going to repair the fence as well or is, or can it just go away or like, what's the plan for that? Is that our jurisdiction or is that theirs? I think we'll slowly find out, but I'm not that's, sure. I'm pretty sure that's CDOTs. I know we've had discussions. We haven't gotten any verification awesome. of when they're uh, really un unsightly. Right. We'll follow up. Uh, furniture and equipment. Oh, yeah. Furniture and equipment. We've been in the below 10,000 quite a bit, and then we're going 183. Yeah. Yeah, great question. Um, so I try to put a summary of all capital equipment um kind of right here so this is did you have yeah this is oh yeah let me look 171 um so in each uh fund department and program we have the fund summary the department summary and then the program summary so you'll probably see there's a lot of redundancy um which hopefully we can maybe cut down eventually but i think it is super helpful right now um but i'll put like an overall overall summary of the big changes and capital equipment is in all of them. So in the general fund summary, you'll see all of our capital equipment that we will purchase. Public works summary, we'll see what's specific to public works. And then uh, in each program, you'll see that as a specific line item. So capital expenses for next year in public works, and this is on page 171. Um, and this is just in the summary. So again, summary, no, fund summary, department summary, program summary. Um, you'll see we have 100,000 for sidewalk repairs. That's not new. Uh, new capital equipment is $120,000 for a backhoe. We have 25 for a grinding machine for uh, road maintenance. We actually used it out here to uh, strip off the paint for our electric vehicle charging stations and also our north parking lot. We had a demo that we didn't have to pay anything for, but it turns out it was like a really good uh, product. So we're purchasing that. And then we also have to replace the fire doors down at the front desk for planning and finance. So that's the bulk of the new capital equipment. And then each year we also have replacements um, that we budget for with our SURF dollars, which stands for Capital Equipment Replacement Fund. We have $120,000 budgeted for a crack sealer then $50,000 to replace a road maintenance truck. So that's the, that's the bulk of it. And I also provide, we also provide a line item summary of the department here. So you'll see, scroll down, capital right here we have hundred thousand for sidewalk replacement mobile equipment is that new um or is the uh surf replacements which is the existing vehicles we already have and 183.5 is for the uh new furniture and equipment yeah six thousand dollar increase yeah or six thousand percent increase <laughs> uh last year we bought a trailer and i think so that was pretty low cost compared to that. We do have the two uh, dump trucks, uh, the 330 that hopefully we'll receive by the end of the year too to help with that. 
So yeah, and if I could super quickly, our general fund summary, let me just scroll. I apologize about the scrolling. I know it's probably not the most easiest to read. Yes. Hold on, I can't catch it. I'm sorry. No. Here is all of our equipment in the general fund. And then if you sorry, go- what page are you on? Oh, my apologies, page 50. So this is all in the general fund. And if I could go to a different page, <laughs> I will wait though. <laughs> yes, you're okay. And then if you go to the all funds, we actually have a consolidated list. This is all of our capital projects, regardless of fund. And we have all of our equipment right here, regardless of fund. Appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah, of course. Yeah. That's all my questions. Anybody else have any questions? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Always appreciate it. Thank you, Mr. Mayor and City Council. I would. Shannon. Yeah. I would like to just mention what Shannon, um, when he sent you all the email and copied me uh, just at the end of last week with the update that added the all fund summary, um, we still have we still have a, a running list. And so again, like like we always say, if you, if you notice some of, if you notice even even you know, I mean, we've got a running list of you know, there's a comma instead of a period. I mean, with a big document like this. So if you have any. Don't worry about oh if someone's seen it or not. Just send it over to me. I we're we're kind of and then every time we do an update, we'll we'll get in that. This last update we spent really Shannon spent the focus on the all fund summary, and we didn't we didn't dive into kind of the list we had for a, a number of the the rest. But the next time we update it, we'll be putting a lot of those you know those uh, narrative uh, you know um, uh, grammar you know uh, improvements and things like that. Um, the other thing is with that email, um, the it's 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 a it's the same calendar, but we tried to add page numbers of the the current draft that we have now of what you can prepare for for the next because that was a great suggestion during the workshop. You know, we instead of like we used to do it where it was like this department, this department, this part, doing it by these strategic areas, you're kind of jumping around in, in some of those sections. So hopefully that helps you so you can. You know, if you want to, if you want to focus before each meeting and not have to feel like you have to read all 400 pages, you can jump right to those pages. But that, so that email from Shannon last week, a good reference point to have in each cover sh sheet will have that same information for that. But if you want to ahead of time, just a, a, I appreciate him doing that, and it, I, I think just wanted to point that out for uh, depending on what your timing is, it's. Timing's not always probably perfect for a Friday to, to Tuesday. <laughs> so if you're looking at, a, you know, oh, I'd, uh, I'd like to jump in and, and pre thank you for yeah, that yeah. done because that was very helpful to have the page numbers plus having the summary Yeah, that definitely helps with um, looking at it as we look piece by piece. You can still have the the overall $34 million right. back, mm -hmm. back to what we're looking to prove. So thank right. you. Yeah. Yeah. I certainly appreciate it. Yeah. And of course, echo what Mike said, if you see something like that trash uh, fun graph, definitely feel free to let us know. I mean, we spend so much time looking at this document and it's so long that we miss things all the time. That's why I'm glad there's multiple drafts before we get to the adopted draft. But even after you adopt the numbers, we update the draft. We have a lot of eyes on this thing, but it's easy to miss. It's 450 pages by the time it's done. So please send those along and uh, always happy to update those. Thank you, Shannon. Right, thank you. Yeah. All right. With that, your report's going to be a little shorter, right, Mike? Yeah, just a couple, just a few items. Uh, I met with uh, Chief Cavalier with Lower Valley Fire Department uh, this morning, Mayor, members of council, and uh, he'd like to invite you all. And it's hard for me to remember which, if if this group already did this or if it was the previous, but they wanted to invite, I think it was the previous, but, or no, this group. So you've had a tour of Lower Valley Fire. Was that? I just missed it. I've missed it. I didn't get to go, but we did just have it. It wasn't too long ago. Oh, right. So they they wanted to invite you. They wanted to invite you to a six a six p.m. to six forty-five on November twenty-first. Do you want me to go ahead and set that up? And I mean, if you've already done it, you don't have to be there. But if you'd like to still, what's the timing of that? So November twenty-first would be our the third Tuesday in November prior to the council meeting, just meet there at six o'clock and be done by 6.45. It's a, it's a fun tour. It's good to interact I, with. I would them, say but. 
go ahead and add it just to honor that they asked us yeah. to do it. And then, okay. yeah. We, then I'll just check with you all as we get closer on. I will not be there the, Thanksgiving. Oh, right. Okay. Out of country. We can also. I'll be in Mexico for the very uh, Hey. So they were not set on this date. Um, I I just looked at the the I was just looking at dates that we didn't have something planned. But um, if we have interest, I can look at maybe look at some other dates that are a little further out. It, it's not a timing thing. So if there's interest, I'll, I'll get it. I'll look at some others and put that before you in the future. We'll just maybe we'll get maybe it's even early next year and then and then we okay all right and then i did want to give you uh i want to mention one thing one reason we haven't brought the draft first reading draft of the uh, unmanned aircraft or drones um, back is uh if you're you know we were as we've been working on it we we realized from the last, we need to get, I, we still need to have a couple internal meetings with the police department and with the planning and development department. Um, and we've struggled with that only because we've had, b besides the priorities that we've been working on, everybody's, it's been like training season. So we've either had police gone or, or planning staff gone or myself gone. Um, so and, and it's not to make, it's easy to make the changes you guys gave us suggestions to, but in preparing for presenting, talking through enforcement pieces, we still need to, we need to collaborate a little bit more so we can clearly walk through, walk through that with, with each of you. Um, it's one thing to just talk about it in general, but it's, it's a different thing to talk about it in practice. And so um, we're not uh, right now that that could either turn into a, workshop discussion if we need to explain some things that we haven't been able to cover or it could be as simple as we add that first reading as you gave us direction to i just wanted to uh, i i don't we need to do that before we can uh so that's the only reason it, it didn't uh, originally it was on the calendar for tonight but we we had to postpone that for that reason can i ask um, you a question with yeah you? yeah um, I, and i can't remember the answer that's why i'm asking um have we consulted with any other local or near local agencies that have existing drone experience that like they actively yeah. have drones within their departments I, and have policies to that they live by that that uh, will help us it's a uh, it's a fine great question Aaron. i think um i know we i know we did from comparing their policies but I don't know how in depth and I'd have to ask the departments on there. And that's part of, as we come back, um, I don't know how much of the discussion in implementing we had, I know we had a lot of examples, right? Like example policies, but like in practice. So we, that's the kind of conversation we want to have internally, but also that, that would be good. If we haven't, I, I think we can reach out to those to help with our. Someone's got to have some. Yeah. yeah. And see what's effective. And so I know we compared. Standing, but, like, we already have privacy laws. We already have uh, property right laws. Are we duplicating? Are we, what's, what do we need to have? That's the that right. English they would have or not um, yeah. no reason to duplicate existing other laws. Yeah. And we're uh, in this, uh, to that note as well, we're, we're trying to d double check what we wouldn't, you know, if what's, what's the minimum we do that the, that the feedback council's given us. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> so James is ready to hit the gavel on me. Um, but, uh, and make sure we're not, you know, and then what's already covered, you know, so doing some of those comparables, but okay. the, the last update I have is about the NRCS study. So, um, if you remember, this is the the federal group that basically funded, I think, about a sixty thousand dollars study to look at specifically reservoirs, to, reservoir two, but a little bit of one, two, and three, and the pipeline that serves the Glade Park Water Users Association. So, not as much with Enoch Lake, but one, two, and three, and uh, we we have not the the report's been finalized. Uh, do we have the actual draft yet? Yeah. So we don't have the draft yet, but they gave us a summary. And I just wanted to 
give you just the the highlights of the summary that uh, that they discussed with us, and then um, and then so that you that you have this that you're aware of this. So um, so basically, they're looking at an an estimate to uh, of two point five million to repair reservoir to this dam. However, to repair the full dam and all the pipeline and other infrastructure that's all together would be for they're estimating 4 million. Now estimates are only as good as the actual quotes for when you when you go out to bid, but th this is you know they've put a lot into this study. Um, they are estimating 1.3 million to breach and decommission reservoir 2. So it's a, it's a pretty high number. It's a lower number but it goes up because the forest or US Forest Service requires not only a uh, typically you would just do a breach, but the Forest Service requirement is to remove everything that's been breached. And that's where the, the, the numbers go up. We did receive, uh, I think, four or five, four, five, uh, five bids related to breaching. We're sifting through those because what we're seeing is even though we asked for the full cost of the construction of doing it, we have... Um, a range of costs, but we're seeing more on just the design of it. And our our ask was not just design it, but actually do it. And uh, so, and then there's varying levels in these proposals of working with all the agencies you have to work with. So, it's taking a little bit more time to go through and see what's fully thorough and what and and where we're at. Um, but that kind of lines. But some of those initial numbers that we're going through kind of line up with that 1.3 if you're taking it from design, construction, removal of Reservoir 2. Um, so not final, but I wanted you to be aware of what we're, what we're aware of as, as, as we get it. And since we were meeting tonight, it made it uh, easy to do that. They, in their report, they've, they've communicated to us that their report has recommendations. Their recommendations are to breach Reservoir 2, abandon the pipeline, and uh, work with Glade, Park, well, and for Glade Park Water Users Association uh, to seek a, a, a different source like a well or some other, which wouldn't be us, but some kind of, you know, but being mindful of that whole process of working with Mesa County and those types of things. I mean, it's never been our intent to just leave Glade Park Water Users Association hanging. And then um, they are basically saying that there's no grant funding um, that they, have any known source with um, for these types of projects. And a lot of times the reason for that, because we always hear this a lot, go for grants, go for those grants, there's grants for everything. Um, it's very difficult to get certain grants that you're doing the work on federal land. And so that's, that's where we get into this, you know, um, the reservoir two, the dam is actually on city land, but the reservoir is on, federal land and then the others the the whole you know the whole lake and dam are on uh, federal land so we run into these types of issues we're still waiting to get the full report so we can dissect it more and get that so and and be able to do an overview of it um, but this is what uh, this is what they had communicated to us so far now that they're done reviewing the report and we'll be releasing it hopefully soon to us has this been shared with mesa county um, Review. we'd like to get, we haven't yet, we haven't yet, but we just, we just got the, uh, Kimberly just had the conversation, shared it with me so I could mention it to you all. Um, I think it's kind of timing of if, if, if we're going to get this report soon and we can just share the full report with them, or do we, you know, if that's still going to keep dragging on, then we'll definitely probably have the same conversation and then say, when we get the report, we'll share it with you. But we've, we've, we've offered to share it with Mesa County and all, all, all the partners, uh, even Forest Service. We have a meeting with them coming up in a, uh, next week, I think, or no, in November, sorry, early November. Um, we do have uh, our realtor working, starting to work on drafting, you know, letters of donation that we'll, that we'll have to go back with you all that's what i was wondering is this gonna it's gonna kind of hurt our chances like <laughs> like um hey this thing's got a million point three yeah need with it it's coming but i mean how and that kind of affect it four million dollars it's yeah exactly. <laughs> like, we're like here you want this 
but everybody but it, it does it it does because it gives it a little more detail but it's it's already widely known because it's on the no fill order and we've been saying because our estimates from uh, for fixing uh, years ago were around two million uh, we were we were trying to be careful and we were in the three to four which is accurate if you're actually doing the whole whole thing at four what they're saying and then a breach 1.3 so um it, it it gives a little more clarity, but there's already the big shocker or price tag has pretty much been well known to all these groups. And that's been, you know, so that's not a new, a new dynamic in general, but this, this will give more detail what actually would need to be done. When you say that uh, what was breached would have to be removed, is that like dirt we're talking about? Like, what are we talking about? Yeah, so, so could we like all that down to the beach property. Yeah. <laughs> Turns awesome. out we need dirt. <laughs> yeah, huh. you want to answer that? Um, yeah. So part of our special use permit with the Forest Service that dates way back, I, I think in the early '60s, calls out in one of the stipulations that if that it has to be all removed. Now, like Mike said, we're having a conversation with the Forest Service district ranger and staff to see if there's any fluctuation with that, 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 that they would consider, but, um, dam safety, the state dam safety doesn't require full removal. You can breach it by cutting it down and lowering the level of the dam, but it looks like forest service may have that other requirement. So we've still got a, we, we do have that means, I think it's early November scheduled with them, uh, because reservoir two is the one where you got it on both. Right. And, uh, According to the state, you know, we don't have to do all that, but according to Forrester. So we've got to figure out how that, what that really means for Reservoir 2. I don't think that's something that's in NRCS's report. That was something we just have to work out through them. But we do have that set up to to figure out. But So there's still some unknowns. I just wanted to keep you updated on as we get information on that one, because it's been a, a, obviously we've had a lot of discussion related to those properties. Yeah, just one other thing. So. Uh, we haven't talked specifically to NRCS yet. We've got a meeting try, we're trying to schedule with that person, um, but we have talked to the engineering firm that actually did the feasibility study. And uh, I did get an email from NRCS that says it is not being recommended for any funding based on you know the cost benefit and the economic financial side of it. Um, lots of public support, obviously, which is what we've seen, um, and I mean, we had a great stakeholder meeting when we were doing this process, but um, just doesn't pencil out from a financial uh, aspect. Going back, those of you that were, if you remember, the, the whole reason we went after the NRCS study and were fortunate to receive that funding, which didn't flow through us, but they just cover it, was the hope of the result being finding funding, you know, recommending funding and another uh opportunity for funding to do whatever repairs or improvements. Um, so that's the, that's the biggest downside of, so no matter what the report says, the, the biggest reason we did it, it definitely did not pan out to have a, a second round of funding to actually do repairs through NRCS. Well, on that, Mike, worst case scenario, if we try to donate, nobody wants it, nobody wants it. We're just going to end up having to put the bill on it. We're just going to leave it. What are we looking at? Yeah, that's one thing we're working with our, with Mary Elizabeth, our city attorney, and also some of the discussions with uh, Forest Service and the state. Um, it's definitely not a, a, we haven't gotten any 100% clear answers, but it do, it is more complicated than being able to just walk away and leave it. So there's there's responsibilities that carry, but we're trying to figure we're trying to figure out every alternative with that um, because this is a, this is the same question we have uh, honestly. If you know we can we have a number of potentials that we're working on, but let's say if none of them panned out, what are we left with um, that's not just continuing to do what we're doing right and uh, um, and so we're still seeking through that. I think those are different questions than they typically get asked. <laughs> so we're um, we're talking with them. There's always next year's federal appropriation bills. <laughs> yeah, and I and I would just add. I mean, we're making all these efforts, and that's sufficient for now with dam safety. But it's not the long term solution they want. They they do not want to keep this reservoir on a no fill order. Um, 
So we have to do something, either repair or breach, I think is really the two options it comes down to. Yeah, there's, there's a timeline at some point that's going to come in. Yeah, and, and, and like I said, I mean, just taking these steps is sufficient for now with the state dam safety, but not into perpetuity. I was not being sarcastic about the appropriations. Yeah. So in terms of if they're looking for more stuff for next year. Mm -hmm. And we have, we actually have had, I mean, you were there with, with um, Representative Bobert and her staff, but we've had the same with the staff of both of our senators. We've had conversations related to mountain properties and we're going to continue to do so because um, I, I mean, it, it's, we're, we're trying all, you know, any Avenue we can seek, we're, we're definitely not, uh, we're not wasting any opportunity to seek after something, but it's it's been a challenge over the years, right, to find an easy answer or an answer. That's all I have for updates. That's it. Sorry, that was a little longer, but I wanted to make sure we... Nothing new on TMDL as long as we're talking about fun stuff? No, there's a hearing in December, and that'll be the big find out. All right, with that, we're gonna move into our council reports and actions. The first one item is changes to the dates on upcoming meetings. Yeah, I uh, with this one, uh, Deputy City Clerk uh, Deb Woods just brought up that, that these are typically things we deal with. We had it on our list for later in the year, but we figured we'd throw it on this one. And does, it doesn't hurt to talk earlier whether you make a decision tonight or not, but... Um, what helps the the further ahead is it helps us in our scheduling. So, um, you know, currently if if we were to cancel these, there's no disruption to any planned uh, presentations, any planned development, or anything like that. And if we if if we were to run into something where we had a, a major issue, we'd bring that back to you. And whether it's a different date or something, we could schedule. But otherwise, we would just plan around it. So um, our our recommendation is at least to consider whether you want to do that tonight or or not, but to to consider uh, canceling a couple of these meetings that land near uh, where we typically have a, a tough time of getting a quorum or even public participation, honestly. Are we okay if I make a motion? <laughs> well, well, before I do that, so I mean, the one on November 13th, as of right now, we don't have any offers on the property. So that might just be canceled correct are we still planning on having a meeting to discuss offers tend to come in last month. right they do i know they do but i'm just saying yeah this was you, you already told us to schedule it but since we were we just wanted to put it that was just during a we really we need period. what 24 hours notice only correct if we need to cancel or change correct um chances there, there could be the chance that uh, you know hopefully not but if if we didn't have any offers do we still need to talk about what the next steps are that night? You know, um, do we extend the time period? Do we do something different? So I, I'd recommend adding that and just keeping it. Keep it. Hopefully we're reviewing offers. If not, I, th I would think we might still need to just do it to talk about uh, adjusting our, just like you would if you're selling your house and you got to change change your, your yeah. timeline and plan, right? So our strategy. Um, and then we've got, uh, of course, the, so these first two we've already talked about. We just wanted, if we were going to do a motion changing meetings, we good to just have a motion with adding these as well. Uh, that's going to be two parts with Butler Snow doing the overview and then a discussion with Two Forks Ventures kind of following up from our our, our tour. And then, uh, and then, so December uh, 26, uh, we've, yeah, I don't know. I don't recall since I've been here in nine years having a workshop in December. Typically, we've you know we've kind of wrapped up budget, we've wrapped up everything. It's usually the the um, you know getting close to you know holidays and things like that. So um, we don't have any plans for for putting anything on that agenda. And then the second, uh, you know, it's an easy call when it's on the first. Um, on the second, it's it's up to you all. It's just uh, it, we can we can easily work around it. We don't have a a backlog right now at that point in time. So up to you all. That's I'll quit talking on that. Amy's ready to make a motion then. Oh, if unless they, we can always have questions. So 
Well, does anyone have any questions or comments? <laughs> nope, go ahead and make a motion. I don't want to waste anybody's time. Approve the change. Uh, I move to approve the changes proposed by staff to the dates of the aforementioned regular, special, and or workshop meetings of the Florida City Council. Second. All right, we've got a first or second. Are there any other questions or comments? All right, hearing none, Deb, would you please poll council? Councilor Purser? Yes. Councilor Williams? Yes. Councilor Miller? Yes. Councilor Hansey? Yes. Councilor Bremen? Yes. Motion passes 5-0. All right, with that, we're gonna move into our next item, which is establishing a committee to review possible localism board. And so Mike, your name's at the top of that. Yeah, uh, per your direction, we just, uh, as we discussed before, kind of keeping this as a placeholder for council reports and actions until we get the board established. I know we we have the online form. I think this is just an opportunity for you all to talk about if you've had the opportunity to invite people, if you have some people you still need to invite. I think we've received one. We've okay, so we've actually got three. Okay, good. Um, all right. Great. Have we decided how many we want that to be? And but a committee is different than a yeah. board. It's a committee. Oh, we have four. Sorry. Here, I'll I'll read the oh, names here. Look at how many do we want on the committee? So we do have we have a application from Denise Height from Tory Minor. From Shanaki Carroll and uh, Sam, oh man, the way it came up on the, doesn't have his last name, but uh, the mayor I know invited Sam, he comes to, he was on, he, he went, he went through the, he went through the academy, he comes to many of the engagements. Yeah. I apologize for forgetting his name. It's T. <laughs> so I guess we'll look at, cause I've got, I'm meeting on Monday with uh, Joan, who's a lady I met that she wants to know a little bit more about what we're talking about localism. So she wanted to meet. So I'm meeting with her before she fills out an application. I told Janine tonight that it's like, she reads all the Friday updates. She keeps up to date with what's going on. So it'd be, she's been here for eight plus years. So she'd be Great. somebody that's not really active, but follows Great. is already yeah following up with what's going on and, and that. So I guess I, that's the type of person I'd like to get on the committee just to give us some feedback. And so the size, is, I know James asked that about the size, the size is really up to us for this committee. The board, we'd probably, we'd want to set limits on how many. Sure. And then Janine, have you heard, you haven't heard back from the current downtown board no, on how many want to be at. Tomorrow night. So okay. There's, there's going to be some discussion about okay. this then. So. so if we get a decent number from, from the, downtown so there's three of them oh, only good. anyways right right so there's three there's yeah so three if you get half of that you get yeah there's potential. we're at it we're looking to have a good size especially okay. we have a good pool to pick from um well, i'm saying if we could get a couple i mean i would rather see 10 to 11 on the committee just because it's giving a little more gotcha fee. that's my opinion i don't know what everybody else thinks but as a committee it's a short term right. thing so the more feedback we get to me Will give us maybe a little better direction on what we do with the actual board if we're going to form a board. There's still a few weeks out before we start to yeah. do it. That's great. We're in a good position, I yeah. think. So if you do know of other people that would want to serve on this again, I mean, I was thinking of past counselors, and there's, you know, see Heather here that was willing to serve on that board. Is there, you know, yeah. maybe some other past counselors that would be? Does anybody know that Cullen guy? <laughs> <laughs> So, I mean, just to get to you. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't matter if we did. <laughs> so He's I'd say gonna know. <laughs> keep looking for people because, again, the whole point is to get people engaged. Yeah. And, you know, uh, I think having that diversity and, you know, I'm okay with a little larger committee because I think it, it gives us more insight. Sure. All right. Thank you, Mike. All right, we're going to move into council reports and actions. I'm going to start down here with Matthew. Uh, I missed the Fruit of Chamber meeting, so I have nothing to report. All right, Janine? Uh, we had the arts and culture meeting last week, and it's kind of just sort of a review of some things, like the review of how the um, art walk went after the installation and, thing, and things like that, and um, just coming into our next meeting really with some ideas about how to, um, what the next year is gonna look like. So that's sort of where they're looking at. Joel and I have a couple of interviews for that board 
for um, for one seat, um, <laughs> which um, made me want to think, ask a question because we actually have two applicants for one seat. There's um, there's currently seven members and there's nine um, seats available. And I guess I never realized that a, the council liaison takes up an actual seat um, of of multiple, I don't know if not all, but of many of the boards. And I am curious about your guys' thoughts about our, us taking up one of those actual seats as opposed to actually like the liaison. A liaison term to me, it's not like like the staff doesn't take up a seat that are on the, you know. Mm -hmm. So I, I'm curious about that we actually fill one of those spots kind of takes away. Hey, that's a good question for a workshop. I'm just I'm just curious. Well, the question was brought up because it was like, oh, do we have alternates for that? Because I know we do the same thing. We did the same thing with planning, you know. Um the challenge has been over the years, it's been, we have a hard time finding people. Then all of a sudden we have a glutton of people that right. want to be on. So in an arts and culture board, as Janine and I talked a little bit, or through email kind of was, yeah. um, they have so much interaction and they have so much planning and work that if you had a couple alternates, it's more people to spread out some of that workload too, because they're very active. But I don't, I know it's the way we set up the bylaws and some of that, there are restrictions on what we can do. Because I, well, I think yeah. police commission, you have to have a, a counselor or mayor on that one, correct? But I'm just not sure that they yeah. have to be counted as a seat member. Yeah, I think uh, the yeah. voting member, the voting is the right. And then, well, even just when it says nine, yeah, members. Yeah, sure. I'm pretty, pretty sure that'd be something you all you all could change whether it's in bylaws or an ordinance that that establishes more um but yeah I, I think that'd be a good i don't know if that's a something you, you want to have a future discussion on we could double check and make sure like which boards if there's any that have a nuance like the charter went more detailed than we're remembering or something you know but i'm pretty sure because we've looked at so many of them that it would be a, an action you all could take that for the majority of like tonight on the planning was similar right well, it, it might be an ordinance process it right. might be a resolution process right. it could be different for each board there is there is the boards and commissions policy too that right. the council adopted and it speaks to it a little bit judy and i had sent you a section of it that talks about council liaison positions and it's kind of weird it's like one board the livability commission uh, the council liaison member does not vote, but on all the other boards, they do. And whether that constitutes being a seat or not, I don't know, but it probably could be clarified, mm -hmm. I would think, in that in that I, policy. I agree with the, like, I've always felt a little uncomfortable, like, on, you know, historic preservation, like, voting on that when they're, like, and then they, it's similar to like planning and zoning where I'm like, I'm contributing to like influ influencing this, but like, is that, you know, right. exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Well, is, is, yeah. Like conversations of, you know, what they ask for in the city and then I get to vote for it. It always feels like a yeah. conflict of interest. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I agree. Like the, to me, the label liaison means like you're just kind of there observing and then, you know, the mode of communication, like you're the, the, you relay. Yeah, yeah. 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 But see, I said on the, we were talking about the museum board and we weren't a voting member and it's kind of like, wait a minute, we're, we have interest in building and property and other things. And so it's kind of like, okay, wait, when, when do we want to have that? You know, what is our interest in that specific board that would really mandate that we should have a voting right. board? interest because i think there are we, some that it would make sense that we do yeah. like kind of oversee a board then maybe you don't need a voting council member on that board right. but when you don't oversee something but it does affect in that then and those like when you right. can't yeah. be a voting member. but then matthew's on the other side of us saying wait a minute we're they're trying to figure out budget uh, yeah i mean they right. can ask us that's outside money. and you know it's, it's, we don't we haven't discussed further is how much participation we want council li liaisons to be on boards we've been 
per se heavy on attendance and, and participation and when they're advisory, how much do we need to be there? We haven't had that discussion yet that we've had or as we've been going through the whole board process. And so I, I, I think it'd be great to have had that had that point plus just the, some other ideas or I other topics with it of um continue that conversation on a um, on a workshop mm -hmm. mike you were going to say something about yeah i was just going to say I, I we'll definitely do a quick run through the boards what it would take if that were something you wanted to change uh, simply you know is it a and each one might be a little different but and and maybe the and the policy as well. So we can we can have that ready for a future discussion. Um, I was just gonna earlier. I was just gonna mention that uh, you know the the outside boards that you sit on. You know, it may be a discussion on how you how you interact with those. But but the difference with those is you don't get to create their bylaws or create their rules. So exactly. you might be invited yeah. to be on a, a board, but you don't, you, you, you know, as a board member, you're a voting member. And then, but then how do you interact as a, as a group by saying, you know, like I can vote on this, but then it's going to go to the council. Right. So, I mean, there, there's some several, nuances. You have GJF, you have Grand Valley Trans. Yeah. I mean, you have things that were vested. I'm saying we don't get to change those, right. but, we can, right. but we can talk about how to Right. Our policy and how we and, and just delineate that, like be like, okay, each, for each of well, these, like here's our advisory right. 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 ordinance or. But I think the challenge is, and I know Ken's seen it, is like, wait a minute, I don't know. Sometimes I mean, he's voting on stuff that he doesn't really know what the council right. mm -hmm. thoughts are. So with the, some of those external boards, it's a little more challenging because, yeah. mm -hmm. wait a minute, I'm at a meeting and they're all of a sudden talking yeah. about stuff that. I really don't know the direction of what mm -hmm. council wants. So I think some of that may be some of the discussion too is, okay, how do we prep the council members that are going to some of these external yeah. boards for, I think most of you guys have a good idea of what our community wants, but there may be things that yeah. they're voting on that we need to maybe discuss. Yeah, that's a good one too to add to that discussion. Mm -hmm. So the question would be when, like, if we want yeah. to do a workshop, what does that look What's like? the next reasonable one? And then, yes. And then in the meantime, since we do have two people that we're interviewing for one C is an alternate position, like, does something have to happen before we even allow that even? Like, would there need to get an ordinance? They're not like, allowed that, to have a... Are we allowed already as is to have an alternate or does something else have to happen for that team? Well, the bylaws, I don't think, I can't remember what we did for planning because we added... All I think we just did an update to them, but where we added in uh, alternates. Um, I think you could... I, I could be speaking out of term, but I think you could designate them as an alternate and then we create in their bylaws... Uh, you know, we'd have to do an update to the bylaws that if it doesn't address it now, okay. right, then then there isn't a position. Uh, well, we do have some upcoming ones. But, but, I know you've got some term members. Term yeah, members. the next one is termed out in May. Okay. That's the yeah. That's the chair. Yeah. Oh. There's always the point that it's like you like both candidates. You're going to take one over the other. But the second one's like we're we're looking we're to things, we'll be, hold, hold, hold yeah. still for a bit. You're not. We, well, my conversation. It's not a no. It's a not right. It's right. not quite yet. Yeah. And the conversation always has to be. They're open meetings. They're public meetings. So you can come. I mean, they're yeah. That, I, and I think that's kind of the true. The yeah. kind of the right. way I would like to. They just couldn't vote. That. They could still be there. And, right. I mean, I technically they couldn't be part of the right con, but, but at least they could stay up to date while right. we figure out what we're doing. I, and technically, that would be the way to handle it and tell you if you chose to make it a change. Okay. Yeah. Yep. And then um, when the downtown advisory board does um, fade out, uh, I was wondering if we wanted to do something like honor or something, all of the current and pa past board members of the yeah. advisory board. Like if we just did some, I don't even know what you would do, but just some, Acknowledgement in a council meeting or something yeah. for them. I think that makes sense. Yeah, yeah I agree. At least to get people sitting out here. 
<laughs> right? Maybe, yeah, exactly. We could get a, a, an amicable audience. <laughs> no, don't do it on a school night. Right, right? yeah, yeah. It's like either a full house or <laughs> third out, hasn't it? I think, we, did we miss the scheduling of that? No, Mike's or... written down. I... So I, I have the three items. Um, I the, Right now on the November workshop is pretty light from the standpoint of there's no real presentation for the budget. We always just leave an item on the budget because that's a great opportunity in between the first reading and second reading. If you have any, like, you know, the, or we receive some new information. I mean, this year there could be a little of that we've built the budget to not have to make drastic changes, but, you know, pending the election and proposition HH, I mean, there, there's always something right. That, um, but it's not a long presentation. It could just be, hey, I had one more question I found, and it, sometimes that goes pretty quick. That's all we have right now. There's the there could be the potential of drones, but we could, I you know, we could we could do this first if if needed, and then drones, you know, later. So I'm thinking there's a potential of doing this on the November workshop. I would say that it would be nice to do it sooner than later because of the fact that we've already been in this process with the with oh, yeah. all these so let's the get this wrapped up potential it'll be nice to kind of get things going for next year yeah, yeah let's get this done. a lot of a lot of, com a lot of these commissions take december off anyway so if we did it then we could try and get some things going by the time they're back oh, I, yeah. i'm gonna thumbs up now. november workshop and then i have one more um question with elections and such things coming up what are the rules of what we're allowed or not allowed or even just what the right feeling is to do in endorsing people with our city council tagline on the back of our name or not our council's past perception her perspective is you get a council to approve you putting your name on it and you're allowed to do that if you're getting wet so if you want to endorse somebody, you have to bring it here and have all the council say, yes, you know, um, so you're not just using your name. Now the paper likes to do whatever they want to do. Right. Matthew, I mean, they, <laughs> they put your name in every article that they can. I mean, they put your title in, but as far as in the, again, this is up to council. If you guys want to change that, you know, that's going to be a choice, but we've said in the past in order to keep things transparent. Okay. If you're going to put your name in it, city council, if you want to put your name on as citizen, then you can do whatever you want as an individual. It's just hard to just disseminate between the two. I mean, when you're in this role. Yeah, my my understanding is, and not trying to play attorney, but my understanding is legally there's there's nothing that keeps you from doing it. But as a group, you guys can kind of decide how you want to handle that. And it's really up to you all. That'd be a I'm tricky always, perception. Right. I'm I, always concerned also in terms of potential backlash. Yeah. So if I say, you know, whatever my title is, endorsing this candidate, but the current candidate or the, there's somebody else in that current office, they know. Yeah. And then is there potential for retaliatory and then, behaviors? Yeah. Even without our title, do we have a feeling about what's appropriate and not appropriate there? Or do we not really get to have a say in it? I don't want us to do that. I if it's I your name, say, I... that's a definitely, I don't even want to discuss that. It's a, it's it's another discuss with the title, but if it's just your own name. It's fine. Is what yeah. I guess. It's your own prior mm -hmm. prerogative. But as Joel alluded to, the paper will. Yeah. The, paper, yeah, yeah. the paper will always add your title and it doesn't matter how you did it officially. We just did that with Matthew this week. <laughs> it had nothing to do with city council or anything it's nothing all and we always keep that out we're very very careful i know i they just know what your title is so. yeah exactly it's part of you okay i just wanted to be have some clarification of that. thanks all right Ooh, all right we got through hers are we done <laughs> <laughs> james um, I was gone and I missed tourism, but it seemed I talked to Shannon about it briefly. We basically just approved uh, our funding requests. Um, other than that, really can I make that. a request for tourism? I don't know how like much communication you have with whoever does their social their Facebook. It drives me insane that they call it eighteen mile road. <laughs> we do not live in Detroit. Like this is. <laughs> 
can we drop the mile? Like, can we at least, can we at least have accurate, like, in the future, right, Mike, we're changing internally. We're going to be taking over most of that. Yeah. And that, that transition starting already. That would be much appreciated. Essentially it won't be in their scope of work. I finally commented on it. I was like, can you please just drop so, the mile? Like please. Is it 18 Avenue or 18 drive? Which one would you? Yeah. Prefer? <laughs> I'm just. Highway comes up to all that. And that's not the only inaccuracy there's been, but that's a consistent, like they talk about 18 mile road all the time. And I'm like, that is. That is not a thing. <laughs> With you on that one. Yeah. I think it's already been communicated, but we'll make sure. Thank you. <laughs> I know it's all I know it's all about me and my frustration level. Yeah. So. <laughs> James. Sorry, James. I thought maybe you might have a little leverage Thank there. You for saying about because yes, that I'm never very happy with many things that that agency does. So that's me. That's it. That's it. All right. Amy, now you can go. Yeah, uh, planning and zoning, we had a very engaged meeting, very, very engaged meeting. You probably saw some of um, the results of that uh, and you will see it again. We will see it again. Um, and then I would like to um, put up, do a proclamation for the um, the family that so graciously opened up their sunflower field yeah. for the community it was a really really cool thing and such a fruit of thing like it was just really a neat thing um so I don't know if I just need to like get with Deb for that like I yeah, yeah. I as long as everybody yeah. gives yeah. you a thumbs up we're yeah good. yeah so okay good and, I didn't expect much opposition but I shouldn't have assumed <laughs> that doesn't want to have to write it so no yeah. no I am happy That'd I'm happy great. to I will just need like some direction on I haven't ever written Where a proclamation where I, lots of where has it <laughs> yeah I think I think uh two sentences whereas after, yeah. and and Deb feel free to add in but I think if if you can get the gist of don't worry about the formatting as much but the gist of like what they what did, we're recognizing. who the people are, and that we can get it in the whereas format. Okay. <laughs> so it's normal. So the question that you want to do is, want to do, because we do proclamations for certain things. Do you want to be like a, we've done it where it's like a certain day is the pro proclaiming their day, or do you want to just be a thank you proclamation? Just a thank you? Like a... Would it be inappropriate to give them like an F work or an F gear? Well, that would oh, yeah. that'd be well, awesome. Is it, is it already... They it's said they up. were going to get rid of it, right? It's still up. Now, the reason I'm asking that is that I don't know. It would be kind of hard to facilitate this, but it would be really neat if we did council and staff and everybody go out and did a picture. And we'd have to do it. Uh, we'd have to do it like tomorrow because the cows get put out, That's I think, nice. Friday. So it's I mean, it's kind of an experimental like they're they're um, doing that property as a no till. And so that was that, I mean, that's the the, the real, yeah, that's the real objective of the property, but they were kind and gracious enough to, um, yeah, allow the public to, the pictures, the, just it's incredible. Pictures. Yeah. It's so phenomenal. Yeah. It's so cool. So I just, I thought it would Did be. anybody neat. get a picture in there? I was we're out of it, but I didn't. Yeah. My I have family picture. members that did, but I didn't. I was going to say, if any of you did, Matthew just. Put us all in there. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> you could just Photoshop our our uh, our group picture yeah. into. <laughs> could, could we maybe it, could we maybe at least have somebody go out and just take a picture of it and maybe make it the header of our yeah the page for a week or so. That we'll might be cool. That yeah. Or, yeah, I think we have. I like the idea of giving a gear or something. Oh, for sure. Yeah. If that would be okay. We have some. <laughs> do we, Amy, I don't know if you or Mike yes. want to get with them to see if they could come to the next council meeting because that would be the yeah. ideal one. Is I'd be happy to. Like, yeah. Right. Yeah. I can get their contact information from the, their their next door neighbors are good friends of mine. That So, yeah. We, That'd be on the 7th. Yeah. Right. Yeah. That's yeah. Because when I worked, yeah. Workshop is next. Okay. Okay. Yeah. That's good. So that gives enough. Woman Miller. Okay. Good. good idea. Good. I didn't think I would get much pushback from that, but <laughs> I didn't want to. <laughs> that's all I got. All right, Aaron. Two main topics. Uh, one museum. Uh, they put an offer to a director. He did not take it, so they are. They still do not have a director. Um. What are your guys' thoughts? It looks like their trailers are 
starting to hang out into the parking lot more again. Over mm. here. I don't. I just it it doesn't look as bad as before, but I don't know. It'd be nice if, if we get them to pull back and just not look like it's a storage lot at times. Well, Sam and I go there quite often for the dog park, and what we've noticed is that recently a sign was put up that says no RV parking, and and that's RV direct <laughs> yeah. result to that. But we did notice that a few weeks prior to that, there was literally people just sitting there camping, barbecuing, yeah, like out there and stuff. So it does kind of invite. Well, it's, it's are, are others you, don't know, it, like visitors don't know that those are not RV, yeah. like public, they're, they're business RV stuff, not things. So I don't know if it's. We, we have to routinely, probably once, probably like twice a year. We have to request them to move them back to the bill. They they'll end up using them somewhere, and then they'll bring it, you know, bring them back, and someone will just park it right in the middle. Um, there's a they got right in the middle right now, and that's yeah. what I was going to so say. The, Can so, we have them move them back? Yeah. So that's fun. Yeah, I think there's four of them now that are out, and it's just it looks better when they moved it back. Like when we asked them to move it for the dog parks, uh, when you were dedicating that, um, it looks we'll just good. do that. I mean, we we do it already. Yeah. So if if they if they're back again, because it. They've got space back in that. Doesn't help with our public parking lot perception of not camping. You know, it gives a perception of camping there, even though they're museum owned. Perception that they're part of the. Right. Yeah, but when they're out in the middle, it looks like they're just sitting there. Yeah, we'll do that. Okay. Um, The last thing is just there was the Religious Freedom Conference. Um, It was a great conference. I thought, and we got some government items brought in. Um, I know an individual brought up. Um, like supporting, for example, Catholic outreach, and is that against the law or not? And it's like, yes, they give money to that one organization, but they're the only ones who help significantly um, with um, outreach. Um, so it was very interesting. The first speaker was out of touch with the rest of it. Uh, In kind. Yeah. Um, I get the hint that he will not be invited back again. I think a lot of people were... Um, curious about that because the rest of them are very much uh right in line with any and all to have freedom of religion and how to do it and not just a grind to an axe to grind man it was interesting but i thought it was a great conference i hope they continue it again um, are you part of that board that puts that together no but i know people who are part of helping it um go forward um and I, I was pushing them to like make this an annual thing. There's so many good things that could come from this um, conference. If it's being done again, I know some people that would be very good at replacing the first speaker. Yeah. And there was a, the the concluding speaker. Unfortunately, I think Matt, you missed them, right? It was a lawyer that that's all he does is practice um, religious law, like first amendment subcategory um religion um and it was awesome how he did it and just the ability to kind of take some of the challenges out and just um bring it down to how do we need to discuss it so it was awesome i think mike were you there yes yeah i've got lots of notes if you want them yeah. from the last speaker yeah yes he, he was awesome he was just he just cut and dry it's like i don't care like he opened it up and it was just it's any and all things no hold no holding back bring it on but that's he's he's paid to go out and give speeches like this um to, into communities so in fact he's he spoke to my alumni city manager group in austin the monday of that week at the conference <laughs> for over a dinner so he's highly sought after i said well i'll schedule him again for next year because i think he was good enough to bring to bring back but, um that's it I did get an inquiry from um, Winston Bremen uh, about the bark park, since somebody brought that up, <laughs> uh, wanting to know when the water gets turned on and off at the oh, bark yeah, park. What's up with the water being off? Yeah. It's off right now? Uh, well, or that, or the button doesn't work. Winston was very concerned. He had played hard. She it's a couple it's not an automated, it's not a self-watering it's not, station. It doesn't have Wi-Fi. It doesn't have wa- two forms of Wi-Fi. <laughs> if it had that, it would it'd notify <laughs> parts <laughs> of it. I will do. He uh, was concerned he was playing ball and fetch. In the, very thirsty. I'll find out and get something in the update related to that. 
I, yeah. I've, Otherwise, it was a two pause up experience. But <laughs> <laughs> all right, <laughs> is the rest of the council done and ready for me to report? Yes. All right, I don't. I don't have anything to report. I have police commission tomorrow <laughs> night. So with that, the time is now 9.39 p.m. and we can conclude our meeting. Thank you, Mr. Mayor.